Hello? Hello? Yes, can we come back to our places? So, we'll start our second session today with the keynote lectures. So uh, we start with uh, endoscopic endonasal approach by uh, Dr. Tadashi Watanabe. I'm sorry for the <laughs> yes, and he is the associate chief, Department of Neurosurgery, Nagoya Danny Red Cross Hospital, Nagoya, Japan. So please give him a round of applause. My topic is uh, endonasal endoscopic surgery for pituitary adenoma. So in this lecture, I talk about the basic, basic approach for endonasal. Ah, no connection. And uh, <clears throat> OK, 
Okay. And uh, uh, later, my uh, junior colleague, Dr. Takeuchi, will uh, talk about the extended approach uh, after, afterward. So, uh, okay, so this is the first report uh, mentioned by, uh, about the endonasal endoscopic approach uh, for cell toxica uh, by uh, Professor Joe. Uh, in, uh, he was in Pittsburgh University at that time. So in, that was in 1997. And he reported a 50 case of, of this approach. Actually, uh, I am from a Nagoya University. And at that time, in uh, 1996, uh, uh, my senior colleague, Dr. Nagatani, he uh, started the endos endoscopic endonasal approach so at that time, we used a uh, uh, CRM, and uh, uh, endoscope monitor was uh, just like this, uh, the small one, and uh, not good one. Uh, so that is the <coughs> so initial experience of our uh, team. Uh, but now, uh <coughs> the things are changing, like uh, this one. Uh, this is pneumatic arm, uh, which holds the uh, endoscope. <laughs> This is the uh, Olympus one. Today I use this one, and uh, this is the other one, the made by Mitaka. Uh, and uh, uh, st when I use a uh, Stoltz endoscope, I use this one. Uh, s actually, both of them are made in Japan, so actually uh, only in Japan we can use, so. But they are very good one. Okay. And uh, uh, we do some monitoring, use a navigation system. This is VEP, and uh, sometimes I use the uh, eye ocular mo uh, movement uh, monitoring. And I use, we use uh, two monitors, and, uh, uh, and here is a holder and the navigation system, just like this. So uh, here is a multi-monitor which shows the endoscopic view and uh, MRI image and navigation system. So uh, now uh, <coughs> my junior colleague, he is doing a surgery and I am assisting him. So uh, so our assistant will hold the endoscope and uh, I can stop where I want. Uh, so it's a kind of a hybrid surgery uh, using a <coughs> Uh, forehand surgery and uh, uh, use pneumatic holder surgery. Just like here's a nose of the patient. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's move to the anatomy. Uh, <coughs> so uh, one of the important uh, anatomies are like this. The turbinate, middle turbinate, inferior turbinate, and uh, there's the arteries in the at the roof of the nasal cavity, which is uh, anterior smoirari, and uh, the other one is posterior smoirari. And uh, uh, one of the most important uh, uh, structure uh, in this approach is a uh, bilian uh, canal and a bilian nerves. So uh, when you take the coronal uh, CT. Uh, you can see clearly uh, the bilian canals here and here, uh, which limit the the extension of the sphenoid opening. So this this is the limit of the lateral limit of the sphenoid opening, and uh, this uh, is also the landmark for IC. So uh, if you drill uh, this bone just medial to a bilian canal, it is safe because the IC is uh, always uh, lateral to Bidian Canal. So it is a very important uh, <coughs> landmark for uh, IC. And uh, this is a vascular supply for uh, nasal mucosa. And this is a septum, and uh, this is con conquer the turbinate, middle turbinate, inferior turbinate. And uh, uh, this artery is uh, important uh, when we use, when we make the uh, septal flap. So 
this is the branch of a uh, spinal palatine artery. So uh, we have to preserve this artery. And the, the spinal palatine artery is, is the branch of the maxillary artery. Okay. The spinal palatine artery is ra running like this from a uh, uh, spinal palatine fossa here. Here is the maxillary sinus, and this is the right side. And uh, here is the boma bone. And this is spinal sinus and the keratoprominence, prominence, keratoprominence, prominence, and this is cella. And uh, uh, SPA is running like this, uh, and running in front of the bidian canal and uh, going to uh, septum. This is a possible branch of a uh, uh, spinal palatine artery. And uh, this is the uh, bidian canal. Mm. And uh, the other uh, important uh, anatomy is here, the anatomy of spinal sinus. So uh, here is the optic canal, optic canal, a planum of spinal dali, and the uh, tuberculum cella, and uh, he, this is the cell torsica, and uh, this is lateral uh, optical character recess and uh, medial character recess. So this is a very important and uh, and today I showed in the uh, surgery, in my surgery. And uh, <coughs> this is after opening the bony structure. Here's a pituitary gland, optic nerve, and then this is interhemisphere. And uh, here is the IC. Uh, here, uh, the, in this catabolic body, I drilled the dorsum cell. And uh, uh, back side of the lateral OCL, is the uh, optic strut. And sometimes this pneumatization is uh, extending to the anterior crinoid process. And uh, what about medial OCL? The backside of the medial OCL is the, uh, here, middle cl crinoid pr process. Middle crinoid process is here. This is anterior crinoid and the posterior crinoid, this is middle crinoid process. So uh, backside of medial OCR is this one. <coughs> okay, and uh, so once you go into the uh, intracranial space, uh, one of the most important structure is this one, superior hypophysial artery. Uh, this artery is very small and tiny uh, artery, but it is important. And uh, it's uh, coming from uh, IC, uh, always it's, it is one or two uh, uh, branches, uh, one or two uh, arteries. And supplying the, uh, the stalk and uh, uh, chiasm and the optic nerve. And uh, uh, actually this artery is branching uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, interesting, it, it branches. Uh, it is called uh, candelabra-like uh, branching. So it means branching from IC and uh, one uh, branch is go uh, distal of uh, optic nerve and the other one is go to uh, proximal. So uh, this is a, a unique branching. So. Uh, Sometimes it is important uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, understand the, the running of uh, this artery. Okay, so let's move to the, uh, the surgery, uh, the approach. So first, uh, first thing uh, I have to do is we, uh, just cut the mucosa at the level of uh, uh, anterior tip of uh, uh, inferior terminate. Uh, and cut the mucosa and uh, dissect them. And then open the, uh, here is a anterior wall of a sphenoid sinus. This is the keel. The boma is here. And the natural ostium I is right here. So we push, lat uh, do a lateralization uh, here. So there will always be a posterior uh, esmoid sinus, so it is gently uh, crushed and uh, we do a lateralization and make the corridor. And then uh, we make the wide sphenoidotomy. So uh, after uh, draining, uh, we can see uh, the cella and uh, some other structures. 
Okay, so, and uh, this is cellar opening. Cellar opening, I always use a drill, diamond drill, uh, when I open the cellar. And uh, I always draw a line as I planned before surgery. And uh, why the cellar opening is uh, one of the key points for uh, this approach. So uh, I always attempt to uh, open the cellar uh, until uh, the, uh, the blue colored line. Uh, uh, blue color means uh, 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 cavernous sinus. So uh, Professor Kassam in Pittsburgh, he says, uh, uh, expose the uh, fovulus the bilateral cavernous sinus and the inter cavernous sinus, uh, upper and the lower. The, he says, always says, uh, explore the fovulus. And then the dural incision. Uh, I prefer uh, inverted T or wide dural incision, like this. And uh, uh, only dura mata uh, should be cutted. I, I mean, uh, uh, we should uh, preserve the uh, shield capsule uh, of the tumor. So only dramata uh, should be cut in this stage. And uh, uh, do the dissection uh, from uh, uh, tumor and uh, uh, dramata. Actually, there is a very thin layer of the normal gland, but uh, uh, it's always very thin and uh, always the normal gland is uh, uh, pushed laterally or posteriorly. So uh, just uh, below the dura mater, uh, you can find a collect uh, plane uh, between uh, uh, normal gland and uh, uh, shoulder capsule. So I use uh, this kind of round dissector and make the dissection preserving the shooter capsule. So after some dissection, I do the internal decompression and then move this and remove the tumor. As I showed you uh, today in the surgery. And after uh, removing tumor, uh, the stretched diaphragma is coming down under pressure of the CSF and uh, just like this. And then uh, we put the uh, fat graft from the abdomen and uh, make a suture. I always I, I prefer uh, suturing. Suturing a dura is a uh, uh, one of the uh, you know uh, uh, it looks like complicated technique, but uh, it, once you used to do it, uh, you can do it uh, in a, uh, not so uh, in a short time. Not makes so much time. So one or two suture will be enough to fix the fat. It's not a watertight closure. Just fix, uh, uh, fix the uh, fat graft. And then uh, if there is a good bone graft, I do a bony reconstruction. And then uh, we use a, a, a fibrin glue afterwards. And if uh, the, the suturing or, uh, you know, the dura is a defect, uh, there's a the big defect of the dura, uh, sometimes I use a, a mucoseptile flap. It is so-called a hadat flap. Okay, so this is a case of acromegaly. I show you the shooter capsulectomy. This is a, a very big one, big tumor. And uh, growth hormone was over 100, and the IJ found it over 1,000. So now you see a, a whitish tumor uh, just beneath the uh, dura mater. And uh, actually, because this tumor is very big, the shooter capsule is very uh, fragile. But uh, uh, now I could find the uh, shooter capsule here the other place. Using this technique, uh, we can room all the, remove the, all the tumor. So, uh, 
So it is a very important technique for uh, functional uh, adenoma, especially. So we use uh, small forceps and uh, uh, suction tip, and sometimes I use a two suction technique. Two suction technique is uh, uh, one of the important uh, technique for this surgery. So now uh, I peeled the uh, uh, should capsule from the uh, diaphragma. Maybe normal gland is uh, very stretched and uh, uh, existing around here. So uh, now I'm confirming the remnant tumor using an angle scope. So in this case, uh, uh, the you know uh, this patient uh, become uh, you know normal range of uh, GH and IGF one. I used the uh, mucosa flap in this time because the tumor was very big and uh, uh, dura mater was fragile, so I used this uh, flap in this case. This is the balloon. Uh, this is also made in Japan. The fo uh, Foley cate catheter is uh, okay for using this balloon. Okay. Okay. I skip this movie and uh, okay. <laughs> this is the <laughs> picture of my patient. Uh, he collected his face from the young generation, and uh, after this photograph. Uh, I s did a surgery, the previous patient actually, and uh, you can see the difference between this this one and uh, this one. Actually, bony structure is remains, but uh, uh, some lips and uh, you know the noses are shrinking a little bit, and also uh, in Cushing disease, it is uh, sometimes surprising. Uh, this is a patient and uh, the small uh, tumor was removed and uh, this patient uh, become uh, this beautiful lady, ne? Six, six months after uh, the surgery. Mm. And this is also the Cushing case. And uh, this is the, the unique case. The tumor is embedding into the cavernous sinus. So in this case, uh, I observed uh, in the cavernous sinus also. So now I'm <coughs> looking the, into the cavernous sinus using an uh, angled scope. This is trabecula, and uh, remove the tumor. And uh, now I found uh, the third node in the uh, cavernous sinus. And okay, and also that this may be the branch of uh, uh, IC. Okay. And then uh, tumor was totally removed, and uh, she became this kind of, uh, you know, the slim lady. Okay, so uh, maybe it is a uh, time. So uh, extended approach uh, will be uh, lectured by Dr. Takeuchi. So I skip this one. Okay. So maybe I should close. Maybe it's time. <laughs> okay, I always close my session. Ne? Time. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Excellent presentation, Professor Watanabe. Uh, is there a question or a comment from the floor? One question? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, one question. For you, uh, do you always perform uh, duroplasty and salaturtsk uh, uh, plasty uh, in all cases, or you can uh, an exception if it is very um, um, a big uh, capsule of adenoma and you leave it, or and you uh, in several cases uh, can um, can get without plastic. You mean uh, re repair, repair of the dura and yeah, the cella? Repair ah, and okay. um, bone. Bone, okay. 
uh, in microadenoma, uh, I don't do uh, uh, suturing and uh, bony reconstruction. The microadenoma, mm -hmm. we don't need to because there's a no no CSF leak at all. So and uh, uh, in a middle size uh, adenoma, I do uh, suturing, and a very big one also I do suturing and. Uh, I always attempt to do a uh, bony reconstruction mm -hmm. because the uh, uh, pulsation uh, is uh, one of the risks of the CSF leak. So I always attempt to uh, make the bony reconstruction. So in several cases, you rem uh, leave uh, the capsule of adenoma or remove in all cases? Uh, actually, uh, uh, I try to uh, find a uh, uh, correct uh, surgical plane. Uh, I mean a uh, uh, shooter capsule, but sometimes it is difficult to find it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, in such a case, I do a, a suction from inside mm -hmm. uh, and using an angled scope. So in a, in a classic way. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you. Okay. Thank you much. Just one question, sir. Uh, you d showed one very good uh, surgery the cavernous sinus extension. Yeah. Uh, I expect there was some bleeding during that side. So w what are your steps to uh, pack that bleeding? To so because yeah. sometimes it is very profuse and it becomes a big problem in small working space. Mm. So it keeps bleeding into your... Yeah. The one thing is uh, head up, the simple thing, head up. Uh, and the uh, uh, second thing is uh, uh, remove the tumor rapidly <laughs> using a two section uh, so rapid removal and then pack, pack the cavernous sinus so it usually stops only with packing packing the cavernous sinus yeah, with yeah. surgery cell and I use a, a fibrin glue yeah fibrin glue yeah okay. no to seal or any other flow seal or something uh, flow seal flow seal I don't I, I, to a cavernous sinus I do a uh, Fibrin glue with a surgery cell. Mm. Good evening, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so I wanted to ask, do you use a CSF diversion procedure intraoperatively or before the surgery, uh, before starting the surgery, like a lumbar puncture or a CSF lumbar drainage? Puncture? Uh, no, do I don't do a lumbar puncture. Uh, never intraoperatively or before the surgery? Uh, no, uh, intraoperatively, no. And I, I never do a lumbar puncture. Okay, so mm -hmm. and uh, the mucosa, so the nasal and the sphenoid sinus mucosa, you prefer to take out the complete mucosa or you lateralize uh, it for repacking? What is uh, your? Yeah, <laughs> good question. <laughs> uh, it it uh, depends on the case. Uh, the, the structure is complicated, I remove it. But the structure is simple, and uh, if I can uh, preserve the mucosa with a bony flap, I uh, uh, cut the uh, bone and uh, keep the mucosa and uh, bend it down, bend it down and do the surgery and then uh, bend it up again uh, and uh, also the mucosa again. Mm. I sometimes use uh, uh, spinal mucosa for repair. Okay. But you, it's depend on the case. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> yeah, f actually, first question I got already answered. Sometimes we use the lumbar puncture. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so, and this my second question is, uh, do you use uh, fibrin glue in every case or uh, the cooperative CSF leak? Uh, actually, yeah. Spending? Recently, uh, we have a Duracell. Duracell. Duracell is a, it's a kind of artificial glue. Uh, so uh, if we don't use uh, uh, fibrin glue during the surgery, like a hemostasis, I use a, a Duracell at, at last okay. for repair. Is there any extra benefit? Uh, if you compare with the hardened flap, so mm. uh, Duracell is giving you extra benefit or extra support? Duracell is uh, uh, almost the same as a fibrin glue. Fibrin glue. Uh. So uh, the, um, uh, in all the cases, I use glue, uh, fibrin glue or Duracell uh, for repair. And mm. uh, CSF, uh, post-operative, like CSF leak. So what yeah. will be your uh, measurement or uh, strategy? Rhinorrhea, CSF rhinorrhea. Uh -huh. uh, so how do you uh, usually, mm. uh, again, open and 
uh, yeah, uh, or? it's a difficult question. Uh, yeah, actually, I and sometimes experience the yeah. postoperative cystic, uh, but actually, it's depend on the uh, previous surgery. Okay. So, if uh, I put a very thick, good uh, mucosal flap, uh, maybe I uh, I order the patient to lie on the bed uh, for one week or ten days. But uh, if there's an a, a obvious uh, hole or something uh, in an uh, observation from, from the nose, uh, in an ENT outpatient, uh, I do a re, so, uh, you know, uh, re operation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, in our setting, we yeah. usually refer to uh, position and also lumbar drain drive. Uh, yeah, so I sometimes the use a lumbar drain uh, in for uh, uh, post-operative. If not corrected, then uh, we go for the risk. Uh, mm. I sometimes use a lumbar drain for a post-operative CSF leak. Okay. Thank you, okay. sir. Okay, thank you again for a nice presentation, Professor Watanabe. I'd like to move to the next topic. <coughs> uh, ne next speaker is uh, Professor Imada from Hiroshima. His topic is prediction of the interoperative location of the anterior commuting artery using medial frontal gyrus as a landmark in the interhemistic approach. Could you start your lecture, please? <coughs> uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, this uh, presentation is related to my previous presentation yesterday. Uh, one day I thought, uh, how, how can we perform the interhemisk approach safely? So I, I, I think uh, the intraoperative uh, orientation is very important. So uh, I'll talk about the est estimation, uh, estimation of the intraoperative location of the uh, anterior communica communicating artery using the medial frontal gyrus uh, as a landmark in interhemisk approach. Uh, medial frontal gyrus uh, designates a part of the medial surface of the frontal lobe that is situated in the lateral portion of the singlet tracus, uh, consists of two, two five gyri in the subcarosal portion. And finally, these converge to two to three gyri in front of the paraterminal gyrus. Uh, incidentally, these gyri correspond to the uh, rectal gyrus and the medial frontal cortex or parasinglet gyrus. Uh, ACOM aneurysm will appear from this deep part at the final stage of dissection in interhemisk approach. But uh, there is little discussion on how to estimate where ACOM aneurysm appears from the deep part of this gyri in the literature. So we evaluated the usefulness of medial frontal gyrus as a landmark for uh, today's uh, uh, presentation on uh, estimating the location of the ACOM aneurysm. Uh, uh, I show this slide uh, yesterday, uh, uh, <coughs> we defined the medial frontal gyrus uh, like this, MFG1, MFG2, MFG3 in the sagittal view. And uh, this is a coronal view, uh, corresponds to the actual operative findings in interhemisk approach, MFG1, 2, 3. I, to I, I talked about this uh, yesterday. So this, uh, this shows the uh, operative field at the final stage dissection in the interhemisk approach. And this is the uh, left MFG1, and this is the uh, MFG2. Uh, this is the uh, right MFG1 and uh, right MFG2. So where the ACOM appears from the deep part of the medial frontal gyrus? I think, I thought. If we were, uh, if we were able to know the location of the ACOM, uh, ACOM at the final stage of dissection, intraoperative orientation will be 
more better and the safety of the operation will increase. Uh, I show the anatomical positional relationship between the uh, medical frontal gyrus MFG1 and the ACOM. Uh, purple circle uh, shows a high position ACOM. Uh, yellow circle shows a middle position ACOM from the tuberculum zera. Low, uh, blue circle shows a low position ACOM. Uh, positional relationship like this. And Corner, in the corner view, uh, uh, and in the operative field of the interhemispheric approach, corner view, the high position ACOM is located, located deep on the more dorsal side of the MFG. Uh, and the low position, low, low position ACOM is located deep on the more ventral side of the MFG in the, uh, in the corner view. So, uh, <clears throat> can MFG1 be a landmark for estimating the location of the ACOM based on the height of the ACOM? Uh, I thought. Subject is 39 patients who had been operated by the interhemisphere approach at our hospital. Method. We, firstly, we retrospectively measure the distance between the tuberculum zera and the ACOM, uh, this is distance A, by the sagittal B of the pre-operative 3D sheet angiography, like this. This, uh, we, we measure this. Secondly, uh, we retrospectively examine the morphological pattern of the both MFG1 and MFG2 facing each other. Uh, facing each other pattern. I, we examine the, this pattern. And we, we retrospectively examine the where the ACOM was located in the deep part of the MFG in the operative field in interhemisk approach for each, each case. Finally, we investigated the method of estimating the location of the ACOM intraoperatively intra using the MFG1 as a landmark based on the distance A. Like this. Okay. And this is summary. Uh, this is result. Uh, Type A, uh, consisting of uh, large, MFG, large MFG1 and large MFG1, was seen in 2.6%. And uh, ACOM, uh, with distance A is uh, about 10 millimeter, was seen around here, around here. And type B, consisting of the large MFG1 and the middle MFG1 was seen about 77%. And uh, ECOM with three millimeter was seen around this. And uh, five millimeter uh, to seven millimeter around this. And seven to eight millimeter around this. Uh, nine to 12 millimeter around this and 13 to 15 millimeter around this. Uh, type C uh, consisting of middle MFG1 and middle MFG1 was seen in 7.7%. And uh, ACOM is uh, 5 to 7 millimeter was seen around this. Uh, type D uh, consisting of a small MFG1 and middle MFG1 was seen 12.8%. And ACOM with three, three millimeter was seen around this. And five to eight millimeter around this. Uh, 60 millimeter around this. So I, I showed this slide yesterday. Uh, do you remember? Uh, uh, in that study, middle MFG, uh, width of the middle MFG1 about 6.3 meter, about, about five, 5 millimeter. And uh, 
large, large MFG one, uh, eight point three millimeter, uh, about uh, ten millimeter. So this is a method of estimating the location of the ACOM using the MFG as a landmark based on the distance. Uh, ACOM, that distance A is about five millimeter, was uh, is located on the uh, deep extension, uh, uh, deep extension of the uh, bit, uh, uh, on the deep, uh, deep extension of the sulcus between the middle MFG1 and MFG2, or uh, on the mi uh, mid midline, midline of the large MFG1, about five millimeter. Okay, and uh, ACOM that distance A is about ten millimeter was seen around this. Uh, that is uh, on on the uh, deep extension of the sulcus between the large MFG1 and MFG2. So uh, that is low position ACOM is located around this, around this, zero to five. And middle position uh, ACOM uh, is located around, around this, from five to 10 millimeter. And high position ACOM uh, was seen around this, uh, 10 <laughs> or more. So I showed some cases. And this case is that distance is nine millimeter. Uh, when the dissection progre progro pro progressed to some extent, uh, we noticed uh, that, that le left large MFG1 and right middle MFG1. So we estimated the uh, location of the ACOM uh, on the deep extension. Uh, this is a sulcus between the large MFG1 and uh, MFG2, about 10 millimeter. So progress, proceed the dissect, dissection and uh, pro proceed the dissection and uh, we uh, um, we, uh, we confirm the ACOM uh, es um, around estimated the site like this. This is the case uh, that distance A is seven millimeter. And uh, uh, after the dissection to some extent, we notice the left large MFG one and seven millimeter. So we estimated the uh, location of the ACOM uh, on the deep extension around this, around this. So proceed, uh, after the proceed dissection, uh, proceed, and we confirm the ACOM around, around this estimated site, around like this. So last case, uh, this case is that distance A is 12, 12 millimeter and 12 millimeter. And we notice the uh, left large MFG1 and middle MFG1. So we estimated the location uh, of the ACOM that on the uh, deep extension of the sulcus between the left uh, MFG1 and left MFG2 uh, near around this. So we confirm the ACOM uh, around this uh, estimated site. So uh, occasionally uh, there is a little error in this method, but in almost cases uh, this method is useful, uh, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, turn on the right, please. Thank you very much, Professor Imada. Are there some questions? 
Great. Uh, thank you for presentation and uh, you did a great job. <laughs> but uh, I just have one question. So um, what's uh, the advantages of the intra-hemispheric approach uh, instead of the just regular terrenal? So you know the all the landmarks, but there is no really proximal control for aneurysm surgery. So how do you think, what's the um, advantages of such an approach? So I, uh, I, uh, I, I think uh, uh, in the approach, uh, if you get the intraoperative orientation at the earlier stage, early, early, earlier stage of dissection, mm -hmm. dissection. so uh, you can prevent a premature rupture or, and uh, you can um, decide to the range of dissection, dissection range, uh, sufficient, su su sufficiently, sufficiently. So uh, the most important thing is that uh, at earlier stage of dissection, we we should get a good intraoperative inter orientation of the acorn. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you can use just a regular terrenal approach to clip such aneurysm. So, uh, do you, do you have any advantages by performing the intrahemispheric approach? Ah. So, what's the matter of uh, doing? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, if the the aneurysm projecting posterior side. So I think uh, the intrahemispheric approach is easier to uh, the understand the situation. So the, if the, the, the maybe it depends on the, the projection of the aneurysm because uh, if you take a terrain approach, it's quite difficult to get the whole the situation of the aneurysm. Yeah. Thank you. In clipping of the acorn, we must preserve hypothalamic artery. Okay, perforators very important. Okay, if the aneurysm projection posteriorly or well, big size or well, high position. It's difficult to confirm and preserve the perforator from the terminal approach. So in yeah, Japan, we yeah. can do the resection uh, um, of the uh, rectus uh, gyrus. But in in the 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 no need resection of the rectal gyrus. <laughs> Hemisphere approach is slightly difficult to dissection the fissures compared to the internal approach. But after dissection of the internal fissure, we can see both A1, both A2, everything. So we can put all kind of direction so much better. Okay, this is the advantage of the. Okay, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Imada. <laughs> On the program, next speaker is Professor Samishima, but he is still performing. So I'd like to skip Professor Samishima lectures. So next speaker is uh, Professor Miyachi. Miyachi, no. I'm sorry, Professor Miyachi also is not here. So next speaker is Takeuchi, Professor Takeuchi, he has two lectures. Cancel, cancel, after two, two? Akimura, yeah. Yeah, we finish. Yeah. Sameshima is cancel? No, no, Sameshima is the calm. The surgery is yeah. the calm. Yeah. And Miyati has uh, confirmed with muscle time, I will confirm it again with the yeah. Okay. Okay, please introduce the.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, today's my topic is endoscopy transferring surgery for the supracellular lesions. And uh, uh, I have one question. How many st uh, doctors are performing the transferring surgery? Raise your hands. And how many doctors perform the, I know, I know. <laughs> how many doctors perform the endoscopic and nasal approach? Okay, thank you. Uh, as Dr. Watanabe said, uh, transfusional surgery is a first line treatment for the cellular regions, and nowadays, uh, thanks to the uh, endoscope, the, this surgical technique become good indication for the supra or paracellular regions. And uh, in this lecture, I talk about uh, 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 transfusional surgery for the uh, supracellular regions. Uh, today's topic is here: skull base opening, dual opening, and removal of the tumor. And uh, this is this one is most important, I think, the uh, uh, skull base reconstruction. Uh, first one is skull base opening. Uh, to make a good surgical corridor, uh, uh, bony septum. This is the uh, uh, opening of the sphenoid sinus. There are many uh, bony septums inside the spinal sinus, we have to remove all of them. And uh, now we can see the optic nerve here, and the cellar is here, and the uh, ICA is running here. Okay. You have to open, uh, expose all of the structures like this. And uh, as Dr. Watanabe said, uh, this one is quite important for the uh, uh, supracellar region, medial OCR. Uh, this one, uh, I, uh, to expose the uh, ICA and the optic nerve. And uh, uh, the bony opening is like this, like a chef's hut. Uh, you have to open the cera and the uh, uh, pranum sphenoid area where it's opened like this. Uh, the lateral limit of the uh, uh, bone, bone opening of the pranus uh, fenodare is uh, optic canal. Uh, you have to open the uh, uh, bony structure uh, along with uh, optic canal like this. It's quite good exposure. And uh, if you open the, uh, uh, if you need the more wider corridor, you have to open the esmoid sinus. Uh, the fifth lamellar approach is a quite good approaching uh, for the uh, 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 to open the uh, esmoid sinus. I show you the videos. At first, we perform the uh, paraseptal approach. Cut the mucosa linearly and uh, dissect the uh, uh, mucosa from the bony septum. Like this, remove the bone. And this is the sphenoid sinus. Sphenoid sinus was also opened widely. We usually use the uh, uh, jewels for opening the cera, as uh, in sphenoid sinus. After opening the uh, sphenoid sinus, we move to the uh, nasal cavity. And this is a middle tabnet compressed to the medial side. And uh, you can see the uh, ancient process here. Remove it. It's a very soft tissue, so you can remove it very easily. And this is a smooth bra. And we insert the uh, uh, dissectors to the uh, lateral bra recess. 
and compress it, break it. After the break, the uh, smooth bra, remove the uh, structures. It's not difficult. And uh, complete removal is important to stop the bleeding. If you remove, uh, if you don't remove the mucosa, uh, you cannot stop the bleeding. And this is the third lamella. It's a basement of the uh, middle turbinate. It's quite sim very thin bone, so uh, you can <coughs> break it with pushing the bone. It's quite thin bone, so not difficult. And uh, after that, you can see the fourth lamella. This is a super terminate. And uh, you can see the uh, orbiter here, middle wall of the orbiter. And uh, finally, you can get to the uh, spinal sinus here. This is an uh, uh, optic nerve, and uh, you can get the very wide uh, opening of the sphenoid sinus. It's quite good technique to open the, uh, to uh, uh, get the wider corridor. And the uh, dura opening is uh, uh, important, I think. Uh, I usually open the dura, uh, as Dr. Watanabe said, I inverted T shape. And uh, sometimes I have to uh, remove the dura uh, in the TS uh, transphenoidal meningioma case, uh, <laughs> trichrome cell meningioma case. Attachment should be removed. I show you some cases. This four-year-old female have a, a, a relatively weak craniopharyngioma. And uh, this patient had a uh, concord type spinal sinus. We have to drill it. As I told you, uh, I opened the spinal sinus and uh, bone inside the spinal sinus was also removed. And this is a dura. Dura was incised. Uh, inverted T-shape, and uh, we uh, use a tenting technique, uh, suture the dura and tent it to the pull and pull to the uh, nasal side to make a uh, uh, wide corridor. Now we are dissecting the tumor from the optic nerve, and here is the uh, SHA. SHA was preserved. It's quite important vein, uh, in important artery. Uh, this is a stalk. Uh, this uh, uh, patient is uh, four year old, so we have to preserve the uh, pituitary stalk as much as possible. And cut it. And uh, all tumor was gone, and the uh, uh, pituitary stalk was preserved. like this. So in this surgery, uh, the important structure is uh, SHA and pituitary stalk. You have to preserve the, these uh, structures. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, two more is gone, please. And uh, Next case is uh, trans uh, uh, tuberculum cellular meningioma case. Relatively small uh, tuberculum cellular meningioma. We opened the uh, tuberculum cellular, as I said, like this. In the tuberculum cellular case, uh, we have to coagulate the uh, dura. Uh, this is uh, attachment of the meningioma, so we have to 
uh, coagulate in the early stage. After that, open the dura. Because the feeding artery was already coagulated, so uh, the bleeding from the tumor is not uh, uh, observed like this. In the trans uh, at Welcome Ceramin Joma, we have to uh, perform the internal decompression like this. Fortunately, this case is not so uh, hard tumor, so uh, it's not difficult to uh, perform the internal decompression. Uh, decompression and dissecting from the surrounding brain. And uh, this is optic nerve, we found it. And uh, this is a SHA. We have to preserve this artery. And uh, now we are using the 70 degree endoscope to observe the optic canal. You can see the uh, optic canal like this. So I think the endoscope is good uh, uh, to expose the optic canal like this. And uh, after the removal of the tumor, mm, sorry. Uh, I think this, th th here is the uh, attachment of the dura, so we cut the dura. Like this. Yeah, all the tumor is gone. Sorry, uh, post-operative MRI, it's not here. I'm sorry, but uh, all the tumor is gone. Uh, the, uh, this is the uh, final part, uh, skull based reconstruction. Uh, appropriate reconstruction is uh, necessary for uh, uh, this surgery. Uh, Multi-layer dual closure widely used, but uh, I, uh, I uh, have a unique uh, closure technique, so i show you. There are many uh, surgical techniques. Uh, gasket seal closure, uh, this, I think this one is uh, uh, most widely used in the world. And the bus plug technique, uh, this one is also good for the small dura defect. And uh, I use uh, this technique, dura suturing technique, uh, as uh, Dr. Watanabe told you. And the uh, uh, fascia patchwork technique. I show you. There are some materials like this. I use this kind of techniques, these techniques. Here is the reconstruction strategy. Uh, in the traditional transfusional surgery, we put the fat graft inside the uh, cella and close the dura, one or two stitches. And uh, in the extended transfusional surgery, if the du uh, dual defect is small, I use a uh, shoelace type dual closure. This one, this one is shoelace. We suture the dura like uh, this type, this, this case. We have best uh, uh, fat graft, like two type of fat graft like this. And the suture the dura. Uh, double head needle where it's used. Suture the fat graft and then suture the dura. Suture the fat graft and dura. Suture the fat graft and then thread the dura. We continue to do that. I think if you tried it uh, at the first time, you feel very quite difficult. But uh, uh, after five or six cases, you think this this one is very very fun. I <laughs> I feel yeah, I like this technique. 
I can uh, reconstruct the uh, Dura uh, within 50 minutes. It's not so time consuming. Like this. I don't use a uh, uh, nasodeptal flap and lamb and rain after the surgery. Mm. After the suture in the Dura, we uh, uh, spread the uh, fibrin glue over, over this area. And uh, if the dura defect is large, we have to patch the uh, dura with the fascia graft. After the removal of the meningioma, we suture the uh, dura. Uh, this one is a fascia graft. We put the fascia graft like this as an inlay graft and suture it. like this. Suture so this side continuously. Only one uh, needle. And then suture so the dura in the, on the, the other side. and tightly tied here. After the suture of Dura, uh, we confirm the CSF leak with the Balsalva maneuver and put the fat graft and compress to the uh, fascia side, like this. That's all. Uh, uh, in, in this case, we don't use the uh, 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 the zeptal flap and uh, uh, CF, CSF drain. This is a key point of dura suturing. You can't twist the needle in the deep surgical field uh, like a uh, naked eyes. You can uh, only push and pull and uh, uh, move up, down, and left, right, and rotate. Just it. So, you have to hold the needle like a hook and just pull. It's not so difficult. You can, you can do this, this one, so just pull. Just pull, just pull. It's not so difficult, so please try it. And this is take home message. And adequate opening and closing is uh, quite essential for the uh, extended TSS. Uh, to uh, choose the appropriate surgical strategy, uh, please master the, uh, the techniques. And dual suturing is not difficult, so please try it. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Takeuchi. Mm. Nice lecture and excellent techniques. Uh, Professor Takeuchi, uh, do you do uh, uh, transoral? Transoral trans approach? I don't way? do that. Yeah. I think the uh, you can. Uh, uh, I I can touch the uh, uh, she. No, you can touch the uh, at Atlant axis. Uh, from the transnasal root. Mm. So there's no need to use the transoral root. Or clivus meningiomas? As for clivus meningiomas, I, I, I've never do that, uh, but uh, I, uh, I sometimes perform the uh, cordon massage. Cordon massage. But uh, uh, it's enough. <coughs> I think the transnasal approach is enough for the such kind of case. Thank you. Uh, to avoid the uh, olfaction disturbance. Yeah. Um, professor, I just, uh, oops. Okay. So, 
Um, Professor, I would just like to ask, uh, since uh, you take quite a lot of the septum and also the lateral, uh, lateral wall of the nose, is there any problem with the, uh, nas uh, the mechanical support of the nose? There is no, no problem. Okay. Because uh, this approach, uh, this surgical technique is used for the uh, uh, ENT surgeon, but performed by, I don't know the DG name in English. FS, <laughs> you mean functional endoscopic Functional endoscopic sinus surgery, you mean? This surgery is uh, usually used in the sinus. So they re remove that, law, uh, that many um, nasal septum, and they do, do not have to do the septoplasty afterward. Hmm? Sorry? The nasal septum. Nasal septum? Yeah, you remove quite a lot of the nasal no, septum. No, no. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't remove the nasal with, septum. With the only, only the uh, septum inside the sphenoid sinus. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, the question is: So, uh, what's the uh, CSF leak risk for Duracell technique? Duracell, yeah, for Duracell technique. In, yeah. in my experience, the. Uh, uh, maybe one or two percent. One or two. Two percent. Okay, thank you. Mm, hello, doctor. Uh, I wanted to know uh, how many patients that do this the transfer uh, uh, like this. Maybe eighty cases of extended approach. Uh, how much? Huh? Eighty cases of extended approach. Oh yes. Uh, how much is the percent of the infections of the CISF? Yeah. There's no infection. No, no infection. No infection. infection. No, no infection. No infection. No infection. Oh, how to prevent it? No, no Because the, uh, we know uh, sometimes the, some patient with the inflection, infection in the phenodial, uh, how to see with the nurse? Yeah. Uh, well, does the patient have a uh, sinusitis or something? Mm. No. Uh, no, no sinusitis uh, uh, before the surgery. Uh, no, no, no. Mm. My, uh, no I mean, the because mm. sometimes the, some patient with the infection of the uh. infernal there. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, yeah. but uh, I usually during the operations and uh, and because the dura was all broken and the. I operation. usually use uh, 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 antibiotics mm. inside the uh, washing water during operation. During the operation. Uh, not not only the post operation. Yeah. No, During no. the operation, and you will use the antibiotics. Only, only it's mm, one or two days of antibiotic in, in intravenous antibiotics. Uh, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. I sometimes use uh, third generation septum. Uh, uh, oh, mm. yeah. Uh, usually, uh, we do such uh, suppressor cellular uh, tumors uh, via serenal approach or subtemporal approach. And you said that uh, for suppressor cellular tumors, you use a transnasal approach. And does the uh, size of tumor uh, plays a specific role uh, by, uh, for your uh, in my ex uh, best choice? In my experience, uh, three centimeter, less than three centimeter is a good indication for the uh, transmitter approach. But the uh, most important thing is uh, uh, lateral extension of the tumor. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, in <coughs> In my opinion, the uh, uh, lateral, lateral edge of the ICA is the uh, uh, limit of this approach, I think. Thank you. Any more? Read. Uh, professor, uh, I just want to ask one question. Uh, it's not working. Oh. Yes. Oh. Uh, when you decide, or uh, what is indication when you use a uh, mononasal or binasal uh, endonasal? 
surgery. Actually. In almost all cases, I use one nostril, in nostril approach. Oh, in almost all cases, even if the patient have a relatively large meningioma or uh, craniopharyngioma. Uh, but uh, I think you should use uh, both by nostril approach for such kind of cases because uh, uh, the uh, manipulation is more easy. So, uh, Mm. Mm. You should use a binocular approach, I think. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's better. Yeah. Even for the extended yeah. version, yeah. mononostril is. You, 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 you uh, use a mononostril approach. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any different <laughs> that you operate on children versus adult? In Sorry? terms of technical difficulty, because you show uh, on the slide there's one four years old cranial pharyngioma, yeah. you approach four years transphenoidal yeah. versus a 76 years old adult. So, any different in terms of technical difficulty, you operate on children versus adult? Hmm? Children. children versus adult. Hi. Uh, the Corridor is really small <laughs> in the pediatric patient, but uh, it, after opening the spinal sinus, it, it's same. I think it's same. No, dif no difficulty. I performed the uh, one-year-old boy in the cranial pharyngeum case. It's a little bit difficult. <laughs> the spinal sinus is quite small. It's quite difficult, but uh, four year old or more, uh, it's same as adult, I think. Takeuchi, for suturing dura, what kind of needle holder is your preferred or um, best one? I use a uh, shin shape needle holder. Uh, it's invented by the uh, Fujita Ika. Fujita? Uh, yeah. How about Professor Watanabe? Uh, professor. Uh, oh. I use a Mizuho uh, needle holder. Uh, uh, also a thin tip. Yeah. Is it your original one? No, and that's not my original, but yeah. How much size? Six o. Six o pruni. Pruni. Professor, I know during the operation uh, you were uh, use uh, into th this approach and uh, using the two nose kind of. And so only some, some only sometimes then the yeah, yeah. So two nose kind of aware. I I always use one nostril approach, but uh, uh, there is a reason because uh, if you use a by nostril approach, the uh, breathing from the, the other side of nostril mm. sometimes happens, so uh, it's mm. really annoying. So <laughs> I want to avoid the, that kind of breathing, so I use a uni nostril approach. Uh, oh. But the uh, manipulation is quite good, mm. of course. Uh, in the patient with the two uh, nose ratio, and uh, if you the the uh, uh, post operations, uh, use the any patient that come here and to 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 speak use, and they uh, maybe sometimes they will feel feel the bite on the uh, in the nose in the, or, or the uni un nose huh? Sorry. Um, yes. The feeling is not good, or maybe some is bad, or some uh, problems in his their nose. Uh, I never ex experience a uh, complaint from the patient about the uh, uh, nasal discomfort after surgery. Yeah, yeah. Even if the I use the binocular approach, mm. Mm. I I think the if you use the binocular or unocular. It's no problem for the patient, I think. Yeah, yes. Uh, because so and, uh, some patients, and uh, if he has uh, the uncomfort uh, of in his, sometimes the, uh, maybe this problem is very, very big for them. Mm. Sometimes and they want to control it on uh, or others, other ways and uh, to dissolve this problem. How to, how to do it? The ENT surgeon treat the patient. Mm. Uh, I uh, I usually uh, 
refer to the uh, patient to the ENT surgeon. And the uh, ENT surgeon treat the nasal cavity. So it's no problem, I think. Mm. Can I say, uh, I think uh, one nostril or two nostrils is not a big, pro big matter. Uh, you can use the both nostrils. The manipulation is much better. Uh, you can avoid the con confliction uh, between tools and endoscope. So you can use the both nostrils. So uh, it's not a big matter. So, so but uh, actually, I, I use the one nostril for adenoma. And I use two nostrils for craniopharyngeum and meningioma. And he, he does uh, one nostril for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because uh, he has good hands. But sometimes, yeah? uh, 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 when, when you use the two nose standard, so uh, maybe because the, there is the uh, systemic of the, uh, the kind of the nose, and so some patient will feel the uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Uh, uh, when uh, you use the two nostrils? Hmm? Huh? No? No, no. No. Uh, uh, sometimes because uh, when you're using the two nose to kind of and so the damage of the cheese and it was bigger sometimes because uh, the du uh, standard, yeah. I don't think so. Mm. Yeah. Oh. So uh, <laughs> uh, post operation, uh, some patient will uh, fail. Uh, the uh, sorry, time time is coming. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> Please discuss <laughs> after the question. So. You, you have one more lecture. One more lecture. Can, could can you I do it? Yeah, could you move to the next lecture? So it's just a moment. Uh, next talk uh, about uh, it's about uh, cover normal surgery with endoscope. Uh, now endoscope is as I said earlier the endoscope is widely used, and uh, in the recent years uh, endoscope have been widely used for the desert regions. Um, we use this technique uh, endoscopic uh, surgery with uh, transparent teeth. We call it uh, the trans shinder approach. Shinder approach. Uh, this approach is uh, uh, invented by uh, originated from the uh, ICH evacuation surgery, uh, invented by Dr. Nishara in 2000. And uh, most recently, this approach is used for the brain uh, interparenchymal tumors, brain tumors like this. There are many C's. Available uh, view site. Uh, this one is the elliptic shape uh, cylinder and neuroport and neuroport mini. And uh, this one is a 10 millimeter size and a 6 millimeter diameter. And uh, this one is not available in Japan, but uh, uh, I think the, uh, this one is uh, widely used in the US. Uh, brain pass. Uh, I show one case, a uh, 42-year-old female appeared with uh, uh, like this kind of uh, 4.5 centimeter carbonoma. And uh, I performed the uh, 2.5 craniotomy in the front heart. And uh, inside the uh, uh, 10 millimeter cyst, neuroport cyst. And uh, at the uh, cavernoma, developed the cavernoma. After the debulking, we filled up the water inside the cyst and dissected it. Dissect the cavernoma from the surrounding brain, like this. And take out. This patient had a, a venous anomaly here, but all the tumor was gone and the uh, venous anomaly was preserved, like this. So the surgical field was filled up with water. Uh, we call this technique as a, a wet field. 
And uh, wet field naturally expands the tumor bed with uh, pressure of water without additional reduction. So you can observe the uh, entire uh, tumor cavity without any uh, additional reduction. So it's quite uh, uh, good for the brain. Then we want to reduce the uh, corridor, surgical corridor. We use uh, this kind of uh, cis, six millimeter diameter cis, neuroport mini. This patient have uh, relatively small cavernoma inside the frontal lobe. There's no need to use the endoscope, I think. So you, can, you, you can treat it with a microscope, but uh, I use the uh, uh, endoscope for this patient. Eyebrow surgery was uh, performed. We performed the three centimeter skin incision and the one bar hole was made. And uh, uh, this is a dura. And, uh, insert the uh, uh, six millimeter cis towards the cabernoma. And the uh, surgical field was filled up with water. We use a wet field technique. The cis uh, can work as a retractor. So you can see only one surgical tool instrument, but you can use, uh, uh, I use uh, 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 CIS as a retractor. Dissecting the cavernoma like this. And after that, you can see the thin uh, cavernoma membrane like this. I think the, uh, it's easy to uh, confirm the uh, residual cabernoma because the uh, shin membrane is floating. It's quite easy. Pull out. And of course, you can use a bipolar coagulator like this. It's quite easy. And uh, all cover no more is gone, like this. With field technique can add up to even the six meter diameter cis. And uh, uh, it make easy to identify the thin tumor membrane and uh, uh, hemorrhage. So uh, I think this uh, technique is uh, also adapted to the uh, brainstem cavernomas because the uh, six millimeter diameter is enough small. So the concept is here, six millimeter diameter cis is uh, inserted to the brainstem and the 2.7 scope is inserted inside the uh, cis and the four steps is uh, used. This 26-year-old male appeared with uh, uh, cabernoma and the pons, midbrain, yeah, a pons. And uh, MRDTI uh, was detected uh, uh, corticospinal tract here. So we insert the uh, uh, cis from the from lateral side. We made a three centimeter craniotomy and we used uh, uh, direct, direct simulation to confirm that there is no uh, pyramidal tract here. And uh, dissect the cameronoma from the surrounding brain, like this. This is a, a venous anomaly. We, preserve, we have to preserve it. After the removal of the tumor, we can, con uh, con we can see the entire tumor bed without any retraction like this. All tumor is gone and the patient doing well like this. And uh, this kind of patient, it's quite difficult to approach to, the, to this uh, area. 
uh, midbrain, I think. Uh, we perform the uh, trans uh, larger ventricle, trans monro approach to the uh, carbonoma. I think six millimeter is small enough to insert the uh, monro foramen. We made a 2.5 centimeter craniotomy, like this. Uh, this is the lateral ventricle and the monro foramen is here. And uh, we can see the massa intermediate here. Uh, carbonoma is uh, behind the massa intermediate, so we cut the massa intermediate like this. And uh, we can see the carbonoma like this. Dissecting the carbonoma in the wet field. After that, we evacuate the carbonoma like this. Hematoma. In the early stage, the uh, uh, water, it become dirty, it easily to become dirty. So uh, it's a little bit difficult to see the uh, entire carbonoma. So we use a dry field technique to evacuate the hematoma. After almost all the hematoma was removed, we can uh, get a clear uh, surgical field like this. So we can dissect the tumor from the surrounding brain like this. Hmm. All tumor is gone like this. Other surgical strategy for the brain stem carbonomas. Uh, in this patient, the carbonoma is uh, located in the frontal surface of the brain stem, so we perform the uh, transphenoidal approach. Uh, the uh, cortical spinal tract was divided like this in the laterally. We perform the transphenoidal approach. Uh, this is a cryobadura. We confirm the pyramidal tract with the direct simulation. And there are many perforated like this. <coughs> we dissect the carbonoma from the surrounding brain like this. Uh, here is the uh, venous anomaly. This is a, this one is a venous anomaly. They are to be big anomaly. All the tumor is gone and the patient is doing well, like this. Hmm. And the lateral sigmoid approach is also good indication for endoscopic approach. Sorry, I skipped this video because of the lack of time. And uh, you have to <coughs> use uh, spe specific surgical tools. One millimeter suction and one millimeter irrigation is good for this kind of surgery. And uh, thin shape, uh, malleable, rotatable, uh, uh, forceps is also uh, important for this kind of surgery. I show you the uh, wet field surgery. This patient removed the tumor. We can dilate the uh, surgical field with water. As you can see, fill it up with water, expand with water. It's quite good to confirm the uh, residual tumor. And we can also see the hemorrhage point with a weak suction like this. It's quite easy to find the uh, hemorrhage point. So uh, that's all.
Thank you. And thank you very much. I think uh, Jack Lee. Excuse me. If you have a massive hemorrhage during procedure, how to manage? Because you can use only one instrument. Oh, of course, I can use uh, two instruments, instrument. even in the six millimeter diameter. Uh, yeah. It's possible. Possible. It's possible. And uh, if uh, uh, the wet field is used, the, the hemorrhage uh, is easy to stop mm. because of the water pressure. Water pressure. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just would like to ask, how uh, did you come to know that you have reached the tumor? Did you use any navigation yeah, for? Of course, I use the navigation. Navigation. System. Yeah. Uh, second question is: uh, You showed uh, one brainstem cavernoma, and you have gone supratentorially. So, mm. did you open the tent and then yeah. go? Yeah, yeah. I cut so the tent. Tent also through an uh, endoscope through the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Do you have any special navigation for the? No to find special the navigation. The same, which is there. Yeah. You use the same. same. Okay. But uh, I uh, registered uh, uh, endoscope tip as a pointer. Pointer. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted. Thank you. Uh, I mm, metastatic brain tumor or uh, uh, glial volume. I performed uh, that kind of that technique. Uh, size, uh, maybe size, it's not so big problem. I think the uh, location is most important. The uh, tumor uh, in the uh, located in the surface is quite difficult to remove with uh, yeah, this technique. So, Excuse me, Professor. Um, during a transclival approach, do you encounter like venous bleeding from the clivus venous plexus, and how do you tackle it? Uh, fortunately, I uh, I didn't uh, I haven't experienced uh, that kind of bleeding. But uh, I think the uh, bleeding point is inside the six millimeter surgical field. It's not not so big problem. You can find the bleeding point. And uh, you can or you can use the bipolar coagulator and uh, uh, cotton or uh, sagittals inside the cis. And you can stop the bleeding. And uh, if you use the wet field, the hemorrhage uh, is easy to stop because of the water pressure. Thank you very much. This was the last question. Uh, I would like to know how you control the, your blind spot. Blind, blind spot? Blind spot. Yeah. You use endoscope. Uh. You are what you you seeing uh, from the tip of endoscope mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. How you control the? the if you the want to see spot? the backward, you use uh, uh, dual endoscope. Other other endoscope. Yes. Other uh, put the other put other endoscope uh, outside the seas. You can see the uh, backward view. You don't have any er any recurrence of these tumors. No. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you very much. Uh, nice presentation. Oh. We are very tired and hungry, but we have still two. Or next year. <laughs> next one is huh? Kimura. Yeah. Next okay. speaker is Professor Kimura. Thank you. What is your topic? I'm Hideto Kimura. What is your yeah, topic? Uh, anterior cranioidectomy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you start? Ma yes. Uh, so I'm sorry. I'm very happy and so giving a second opportunity to talk about my research, clinical works. And after my lecture, I need to back to my country, uh, town. So I'm so happy to sharing with these two days stay in Bantane for the winter. And uh, I so enjoyed and sharing with a good time. Thank you for your co all your colleagues and the Professor Yoko Kato. 
Yeah, thank you. I want to express my great appreciation. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, okay, please turn down the right, please. My to next topic is uh, anti-recriminalectomy. For the let's back to the, the uh, again cerebral vascular region. So to to perform the safe anterior cranial is to know is uh, the anatomy of the anterior cranial the process, anterior cranial process. So anterior cranial process is a posterior, as you know, the posterior uh, direct, directed projection, posterior directed projection of the medial end of the spinal reach. Here the rest of spinal wing. And it's this process connected three bony connection and superior medial lateral base, and so-called roof of the superior orbital fissure. And the third second is a superior medial base connected to the roof of the optic canal here. And third is an inferior medial base connected to the optic strut here. When you, we perform, we uh, remove the anterior cranial process, you should remove, drill out or lunge out by three bony connections. A way we need to perform the anterior cranioidectomy. Of course, oh sorry. Of course, the especially when they're treating with a patient with trivial gram zero meningioma, or a spinal rich meningioma, or as you know, the aneurysm, paracrinoid aneurysm, and the this is so rare and the upper basilar region, uh, basilar aneurysm. So which way to choose them to perform the anterior cranioidectomy? Extradural or intradural? Maybe which way you can choose. But my recommendation is to doing the Professor Do Takizawa down in this morning, uh, anti extradural anterior cranioidectomy, I recommend to perform. But in some tumor cases, maybe performed by intradural removal, maybe preferred. But uh, uh, up to the tumor compression to the optic nerve. Maybe the, today's topic is uh, for the arterial vascular region. To so the region, I recommend to perform the extradural anterior So, sorry. So, here I show you the steps of the, the perform the extradural anterior cranioidectomy. First, if, if you, of course you have to perform the front temporal craniotomy and detachment of the dura, front temporal dura, as wide as possible, and the drilling of the orbital fissure, drill away, to keep to within the surgical field as wide as possible. After that, you can understand, you can see the meaning orbital band here. So it means the lateral edge of the superior orbital fissure. You can cut the meaning orbital band here. And exposure of the lateral surface margin of the anterior cranial process here. And removing here this process and opening the, opt oh, sorry, drill away here and disconnected the roof of the optic canal and uh, drill away and uh, the optic strut and finally you can remove the, the tip of the anterior cranial process. Here I show you the how to do, how to perform by showing the cadaver dissection. This is caliber, uh, from temporal craniotomy down. <laughs> the focus is not so much. And this is, you know, the meaning of the band. And cut just a periosteal dura and elevate it. Um, dura propria, laterally. And so as to expose the anterior cranial process here. And drill it away. And the, there is no wrap, so you can uh, visualize the anatomical structure so well. Here, 
Here you can see the optic slot here. And this is the optic canal. And finally, you can remove the tip of the anterior cranial process here. And you can already expose the, the lateral surface of the cavernous sinus. As it shows three, and uh, first, and the V1, V3, V, V, uh, V3, V3. And there was the inside further. You can detect the aftermic artery here, just under the optic nerve. And there was the inside of circumferentially along the distal drawing. Next is a clinical case. Is a she is a sorry, a 53 year old female suffering the symptomatic visual disturbance like here, and aneurysm dome was uh, projected superiorly. So aneurysm a little bit uh, larger for my for me. So I performed this aneurysm to treat by using the suction decompression technique, as you show as you shown by Professor Takizawa. And also from, from temporal craniotomy performed. And as, as I showed you, the periosteroidula was incised so as to expose the lateral surface of the cavernous sinus, as you can see here. To uh, avoid the heat injury to the optic nerve, the meticulous and continuous suction uh, irrigation to the optic nerve is mandatory. Always irrigation, 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 cooling down up to the optic nerve, very important. <laughs> and drill away under the anti-acronal process. And finally, you will do the tip. The anterior process. Here the, you can see the. Sorry. Ah, the, I use a sonopet to burn longer to remove the remaining optic strut. Like here. This is a C3 carotis here. This is a chromotan nap always running here. ICA running here. And there was inside the further. And optic cyst was op also opened. Here, the, uh, this the draw ring, and the C3 carotid here, and chromotan nerve running here. Just always, I can detect the ophthalmic artery just under the optic nerve here. And this the draw ring was also further incised medially. As I mentioned, the, the patient, the suction decompression technique was used by do using the tracheal tube, uh, sorry, feeding tube, but insert it to the, by, by your uh, superasyroidal artery. And this RIC was exposed already. That's over here. And the uh, distal clip was applied and the suction decompression run started. As, um, uh, as showed by in the morning, the aneurysm de decompressed sufficiently and clip was applied. This technique is not so difficult now. As once you un uh, understand the anatomical structure and technical uh, pit, pit it's not difficult procedure. The patient has no new infarction, new, new hemorrhage, and the aneurysm disappeared. And the visual disturbance uh, improved post-operatively. Maybe three months, later, three months later, she recovered so well. And next case is a 59-year-old female with also right paracrinoid aneurysm. The aneurysm projecting medially Next CT and I will show you. Like this. Medially. Infra medially. 
and uh, it's partially embedded into the cavernous sinus up here. The patient was so intended to be uh, receive the surgery, so I performed to, uh, direct surgery to avoid the recurrence. Sorry. Oh, sorry, the patient was positioned like this, and the skin shown was uh, shown here. As, I sh as I did, uh, described the same manner, the anterocranial process, lateral margin of the anterocranial process was exposed, and using the micro longer, recently I used them to remove the tip of the anterocranial process to avoid the heat injury to the optic nerve. After removing the tip of the anterocranial process, the dural incision, was the linear dural incision, is tough enough to approach this aneurysm, as the professor down. And uh, the preoperative CT angel already said that aneurysm penetrates the distal dwelling directory. So the distal dwelling was widened by this aneurysm. So I need to, uh, I, when I apply the clip, I need to circumferentially incise the distal dwelling, this kind of aneurysm. And finally, I incise the distal dwelling circumferentially. I apply the clip. Not large, not just, just a ordinary size aneurysm. So the procedure is not so difficult. ICD detected, aneurysm disappeared and the endoscope was also introduced to confirmation of the braid, aneurysm braid, and there is no normal structure was included in the braid. Okay, no, no CT, no new infection, no new hemorrhage and the CT angel, no problem. And the second case, uh, last case is a 51 year old also female, and superior projecting aneurysm. So the problem with this case is uh, aneurysm disappear uh, attached to the directory anterior cranial process. So in the morning, in this kind of session, you know, how to avoid the rupture, interoperative rupture to this kind of aneurysm? It may be very, very important to this aneurysm. So my, my, prep, my recommendation, My recommendation is to just removing the anterior cranial process is safe, safer using the micro rongeu. However, the tip around the anterior cranial process should, should use the meticulous drilling procedure. The partially removed anterior cranial process and once inside the dura and to confirm the interdural um, structure. So you can see the aneurysm dome here and the remaining anterior cranial process here. This is the remaining anterior, anterior cranial process, and after that, the meticulous drilling procedure was launched again, once again. The remaining tip was removed carefully, and the aneurysm dome was sharply dissected, uh, uh, exposed, dissected the remaining dura, and the dome was really exposed. It's also red, about to rupture. <laughs> yeah, so risky the aneurysm, and the clip was applied any problem. Okay, so my, it's my con conclusion. In training uh, for to perform the safe and reliable skull base surgery, to knowledge to over skull base anatomy, and you, have, you need to perform, if possible, to perform the cadaver dissection. And the experience of the, of course, you have many cases of as assistance. And the, in the actual surgery, Always be aware of normal anatomy, what will exist over there, over there, okay? And the inspection of the microanatomy. Make bloodless surgical uh, operative field and never give up to accomplish it. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Professor Kumala. Any questions?
Uh, great job <laughs> again. So um, my question is, um, so then you just dissect the um, meningeal optic band. So there is a really uh, thin la layer of the duplicature of the dura between the nerves and the instrument. So have you ever experienced any nerve palsy after the dissection? No, no. no. so it's safe. It's safe. Okay. But uh, your advice to perform it as much um, easily as it possible, right? To so the dissection movement really easy, not mm, like hard movements inside this uh, cutting. But you also use the mm, dissector, the blunt dissector. Okay. So it come off easily, right? Okay. And uh, the next question is, um, what if you open the um, clinoid uh, sinus recess in the anterior clinoid process? So if the sinus was opened, uh, how do, how to prevent the CSF leak postoperatively? Yeah. With the fibrin gel. Okay. Perfect. So, and uh, have you ever experienced the CSF leak and how did you overcome with it? No problem. No problem. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Professor Kimura. Okay, final speaker is Professor Samejima from. <laughs> Hamamatsu, from Hamamatsu, okay? No, no, she has two lectures, but we have not enough time. Also, he don't know he have a lecture today. So <laughs> he changed his topics, and only one lecture, more long time. Professor Sameshima, could you please give a lecture? I'm from uh, uh, Hamamatsu city, and far from uh, one, uh, one and a half hours by car from here. And uh, so my name is uh, Tetsuro Sameshima. So then my topic is, uh, uh, it's, uh, like, uh, uh, general uh, uh, techniques uh, in skull base surgery. This is my colleagues, and uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, young colleagues. And then so also I, I have a, a good memory in this hospital. So some uh, guys are here. And, uh, this is the, uh, this hospital. I have a surgery, and uh, usually one or two times uh, in this hospital that I have a surgery. So my uh, subspecialty is a skull base surgery, especially for uh, posterior fossa approaches, uh, so like this, and the combined transpetrol approaches. So that I have uh, uh, two or three cases uh, uh, per week, uh, like this uh, surgery. And then t tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's case is like this, uh, this one after tomorrow in this one and this one. And uh, so uh, sometimes I, I have to do the uh, direct clipping for uh, uh, difficult location, uh, and, and, uh, direct clipping for the anism in the uh, difficult locations. So this is uh, and, uh, uh, my major case is in the February. So now the, uh, we have a dissection course also in my university hospital. And uh, some guys and from uh, this hospital, uh, so so this is a 2000, uh, last year, and uh, this is a 2016, uh, this one. And then, uh, so this weekend, though we have a three days courses, uh, dissection course, and so there, uh, there's three days, uh, full days, uh, like this, and from frontotemporal cranial to me, and the orbitozygomatic, 
and the cryo ectomy optic canal decompression and uh, uh, extradural middle fossa exposure uh, also anterior transpetrol approaches and the last day is a lateral suboccipital approach transcondia transmastoid approaches so this is a cadaver dissection course that i showed uh, uh, like this uh, pictures so uh, dr professor kimura had uh, already uh, uh, oh sorry uh, showed uh, some um great uh, uh, video and it's so also unfortunately uh, some friend in the in the world and uh, invited me uh, for a dissection course as an instructor and the surgery and also in Japan and the France and uh, uh, Bangkok and uh, I have uh, some surgery in, in Bangkok and uh, this is a curing university in Tokyo and then this is uh, India and the China uh, also Shanghai and the Suzhou and the Nanjing in China. I have a sur surgery like this, Indonesia, in Italy and uh, Russia and uh, England. So uh, I told you that uh, my subspecialty is uh, skull base uh, surgery, especially for a tumor, benign tumor, and uh, sometimes I have to do the direct uh, clipping to using uh, uh, skull base techniques. So uh, we, uh, I have to teach uh, my young colleagues uh, uh, at least uh, eight basic skull base technique. Uh, or the zygomatic approach, extradural uh, drilling and the shaving of the front temporal base, optic canal decompression, and then remove, uh, how to remove the anterior crinoid, elevation of the, of the anterior uh, temporal dura, so-called dura propria and the pre, uh, pericabinous approaches. Uh, so the, uh, I, I showed another one. So, the, so I will skip uh, this uh, anatomy. And, uh, and this weekend, I will uh, uh, like uh, I have to uh, teach uh, my young colleagues in my university hospital. So I will, I will skip how to uh, remove the anterior crinoid. Uh, the Professor Kimura already uh, um <coughs> uh, uh, described about this. So uh, this this a cranial uh, small. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Like so. so. A small one, a uh, small uh, cranial pharyngioma. Uh, sorry, uh, how I don't know why. The, uh, oh, this one, maybe this. One. Oh. I showed that uh, surgical video. Oh. This is a small one. I choose a, a light side. <coughs> Uh, frontotemporal craniotomy uh, approaches for uh, this kind of a cranial pharyngioma. This is a, just a regular frontotemporal craniotomy. And then uh, I, I, so I'm making a flat and uh, so called orbital un unroofing like this. And then I elevate in the dura propria from the superior orbital fissure after cutting the meaning orbital band. So then I uh, expose the anterior crinoid. And here, and then uh, so uh, internal debulking using a drill, high speed drill, and they uh, elevate from the uh, surrounding tissues, uh, chip of the anterior crinoid, and then remove like this. It's not so difficult uh, technique, this one. And the first technique for my young colleagues. Uh, after, uh, still, uh, we, we can see the uh, uh, or, or, orbital st uh, um, optic strut. And uh, uh, to remove this one, I use uh, a sonopet uh, and a uh, small, mm, uh, this one. So, so, they, so I just elevate the appropriate, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, oh. Oh, sorry, sorry, one more. So the, you, you can see this is the, uh, the extradural pericabinous approach. You can see the uh, optic nerve, uh, the third nerve, fourth nerve, and the V1, V2, V3 is here. And then this uh, is uh, dura, so called the dura propria. And uh, so you, you can see that this is the extradural exposure uh, for the pericabinous superior fissure. So I cut the uh, dura like this and in, uh, uh, so uh, towards uh, between the optic cis and uh, carotid like this. So this is the optic cis. The optic nerve is here, and the carotid is here. And then so this white line is so-called uh, 
uh, distal dural ring. Okay, this is an optic uh, 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 carotid. I see carotid. This is a, a proximal ring, distal ring, second nerve, op, uh, oculomotor, fourth nerve, sixth, sixth uh, V1 is here. So this uh, is a uh, uh, Binko Dorrance, Professor Binko Dorrance uh, uh, described this uh, wonderful books. You see the C2 and the C3, C3 and the ophthalmic artery is here. Uh, and then so uh, internal debulking and uh, I'm elevating a, a tumor capsule from the uh, uh, power, I see perforators. So there uh, you can see the stroke is here and then the optic nerve is here. As much as possible, I try to, uh, to, to, to preserve the stroke uh, uh, in the uh, craniopharyngeal surgery. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm elevating a tumor capsule from the hypothalamus and uh, uh, under the optic nerve and uh, also oh, 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 here and then uh, chiasma and then uh, I remove the, this, tu this tumor uh, the between the second nerve and the carotid. So the over there you can see the white one is the hypothalamus. Okay, and then uh, so finally, I cho cho and so you, you see the stalk and the over there in the vaginal artery is here, so like this. Uh, so the, uh, this, this patient got uh, finally a baby. So, but uh, usually uh, for cranial pharyngeoma, I, uh, my favorite is uh, interhemispheric trans lamina terminus approaches. Also on the uh, kids, uh, and, uh, I uh, would like to remove the everything. Uh, I, I don't like uh, uh, recurrence and uh, radiation therapy, and I try to remove that totally. This pair uh, boys are the, uh, almost blind, le the left side, and then the, within one week, uh, his eye uh, visual, uh, visual uh, field and also visual power that recovered like this. So and also and then this is nine uh, years old girls and uh, uh, so tumor already embedded to the uh, hypothalamus but uh, I don't want to the, uh, remove, uh, leave the uh, some uh, tumor and so the, I don't like the recurrence and I try to remove everything and uh, so uh, uh, still uh, he, oh, 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 of course and she needs a steroid. Uh, cortisol and uh, thyroid and uh, GH, but she, she is fine and uh, no recurrence. So I need also, and after I remove the anterior crinoid and optic uh, cease and then so the exposing, and uh, after that, and my young colleague uh, just uh, put the clip like, like this, it's very easy. Also supracrinoid, uh, I also, and uh, it's not so difficult after uh, anterior crinoid, uh, so like this. Uh, so also on the big one, uh, looks big, but uh, so neck is uh, so not so big and uh, is, is, uh, uh, creeping is not so difficult one. So also on the, this is a uh, uh, big one, and uh, is, uh, I choose the uh, left side and the uh, front temporal uh, uh, ant uh, anterior crinoid duct me and the optic canal uh, decompression. Uh, so like this, I uh, cut the uh, meaning orbital band and uh, Exposing a uh, uh, supraorbital fissure and uh, so anterior crinoid is here. And then also on the uh, internal debulking on the uh, anterior crinoid and then decompression of the uh, optic cyst. And then the same technique, uh, uh, always the same. So the yellow one is uh, aneurysm. And then I cut the uh, uh, optic struct. I cut the dura, also the same individual. Uh, like this, so between the C, e, carotid cyst and the uh, optic cyst, uh, uh, I see, and uh, I'm elevating a tumor, ca uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I need a tumor uh, capsule from the optic nerve, this is the A1, and then so the, we can uh, uh, clip, uh, the neck clip directly, so like this, okay? After surgery, CT angel shows a, uh, uh, good, good, one, good uh, result. So we, we have uh, also a hybrid uh, operating room. So this guy is uh, my uh, colleague, the endovascular surgeon. Uh, he, he puts the uh, coil. Uh, sometimes I sit here and I open the craniotomy and uh, the, I try to uh, the, the perform the uh, direct clipping. We do that together. So also this one, uh, the another endovascular surgeon is the uh, 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 
uh, in the university hospital uh, try to the endovascular surgery for this uh, kind of uh, uh, ICE unruptured aneurysm. And uh, it, uh, he did that already two times. Uh, but uh, still, uh, you, can, you see the flow from the IC like this, and then compressing the optic, optic nerve. And uh, his eye, left eyes are almost blind. So the endovascular uh, uh, surgeon asked me to do the direct uh, clip. So, the, so I um, put that uh, temp temporary clip and uh, carriage it, and then uh, so internal debulking as much as possible. I mean that to uh, remove the uh, uh, inside and the uh, thrombosis, the anism, and then also and the coil, uh, cut, cut, and the cut, and the coil, and then uh, may, uh, we can make the uh, neck, and then we can put the direct clipping. So uh, the, uh, the, this uh, looks cavernous sinus meningioma. It's uh, not true cavernous sinus meningioma. Uh, so we can uh, uh, choose uh, uh, Parkinson's triangle uh, between the fourth and the S V1. Uh, also sometimes uh, the V1 and the V2, so that we can remove it like this. I will skip the uh, uh, video. Uh, also, and this is a large one, and pericabinous meningioma, and uh, we can remove everything. And uh, so uh, this guy is no, uh, simple, has no symptom after surgery. So also sometimes uh, the uh, meningioma invaded to, to the, to the foramen uh, rotundum and uh, sometimes ovare, and uh, we can uh, choose uh, uh, this area, uh, so-called uh, lateral loop between the V2 and V3. So the, this one, the V1 and the V2, and the uh, loop is, uh, is, is uh, between the V2 and the V3. So I will skip the uh, uh, video. This is a petrochlebar meningioma. So this is, uh, you, you almost petrochlebar meningioma, we can, uh, using anterior petrosectomy, uh, we can remove the uh, all, uh, 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 90 to uh, uh, 80 to 90 percent. So, so-called anterior trans, so -called trans approach is uh, extra uh, subtemporal approaches to 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 uh, uh, reach to the pericabinous area, uh, upper cribus and uh, petrous apex, upper cribus and uh, around the ISC, and the posterior trans approach is uh, from a uh, pre sigmoid area. Uh, so, so, this is a small intracanal acoustic neuron. I will skip this one. Uh, so the, uh, my skin incisions uh, almost like this. Uh, sometimes uh, so we, this one. So I will skip uh, this uh, approaches. This uh, is uh, meningioma. That is typical uh, petrochlebar meningioma. Uh, so uh, we can remove the uh, petrous uh, apex, uh, so-called Kawase's triangle between the GSPN, arc etemens, petrous ridge, and uh, uh, posterior border of V3. So there uh, we can choose, uh, uh, we can expose the tumor. Uh, also the trigeminal is here, and the seven and eight is here, and the six is here, vaginal artery is here. So brainstem is here. So uh, you can see the post-operative CT scan shows uh, how much I uh, remove the uh, uh, petrous apex. So the mo another uh, important thing is how to uh, preserve the six now. Uh, sometimes the tumor is uh, uh, engulfing the six nerve is here. So the, uh, I have to, to, to remove the small pieces of uh, uh, here. And uh, uh, before surgery, and he, he, this patient already had a six nerve palsy. And uh, after surgery, uh, within, I, I think, six months, and he, he recovered, so like, like this double vision. Uh, this is a trigeminal schwannoma. Uh, almost a trigeminal schwannoma can be uh, removed by the middle fossa approach, like this. Uh, sometimes a retro sigmoid, and, and uh, using uh, sometimes uh, I use uh, anti trans approaches. This is a pericabinous uh, trigeminal neuron. Middle fossa approaches are very uh, uh, useful for these uh, uh, high school boys. So, also that the dumbbell shape uh, type is also a uh, 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 middle fossa approach is very useful. So also this one is also. Uh, but uh, this trigeminal schwannoma uh, uh, is. Uh, in the posterior fossa, almost in the posterior fossa, I choose the retro sigmoid approaches. So and also on the vascular uh, 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 disease, uh, uh, this is a uh, vaginal trunk uh, anism, anterior transpetrodectomy is very useful because uh, uh, after remove the uh, petrosa, uh, the, uh, we can see the uh, anism 
is a directory. This is a posture of posture dura. So you, you see the inferior petrolal sinus is here. This is a uh, tentorial edge. So, the, so the you can see the, uh, this white one, the six now. This, uh, this is a vaginal artery. This one is a anismal neck is here. So the, uh, from here to here. So the, you can see the directory. And then my young colleague then put the clip directory, the straight clip like this. So this is a, a, a petrol CPS chondroma. Con uh, they're using uh, the same techniques. Uh, this patient uh, hearing the Ricabat. Uh, also, chondrozarcoma six now palsy is a uh, uh, Ricabat also. And uh, also the cholesterol granuloma. Uh, this is uh, uh, also the doctors uh, from uh, uh, South. <coughs> this, uh, also, this guy's uh, six now palsy is uh, uh, recovered from the uh, after surgery. Also, Cordoma is uh, uh, using uh, uh, some of uh, the master I always skip this one. So this, this was skip one. I would like to show the, uh, 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 this one is a, um, this is a petrochrybal meningioma. I choose a combined petro uh, the approaches. So it uh, depends on the adhesion of the brain uh, the, uh, uh, to the surface of the brain stem. I will leave uh, some pieces of like this. The, the patient has no uh, deficit, and uh, or also uh, the, his uh, hearing in the recovered after surgery. Also, I leave uh, the tumor capsule is like this. So it dep depends on the adhesion. I will uh, skip the retrosigmoid approaches. Uh, this and then uh, this is a cabin, uh, cabin, uh, cabin noma. Uh, <coughs> and I choose a retrosigmoid approaches. Uh, I, 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 I uh, cut the here and then leave with this. The before surgery here, she could not uh, the walk around and uh, after surgery, uh, after two weeks, and then she has uh, no deficit now. So, so CP angle meningioma. I choose uh, three A major approaches that depend on the uh, where is the facial and the seven and the eight nerve. If the seven and eight and the stay in the uh, proximal side, uh, the frontal side, and I choose a retrosigmoid approaches. Uh, if tumor is uh, uh, seven and eight, uh, stay in the dorsal, I choose an anterior to petrosal approach. Uh, if the tumor is uh, large, and I choose a combined transpetrosal approaches. This is a sh just a CP angle meningioma. Uh, seven and eight is a uh, uh, frontal side, I choose a sh uh, just a regular retrosigmoid approaches, also this one. Also, this is uh, not uh, uh, combined, uh, just a tentorial meningioma. Uh, th th this is a retrosigmoid approach is good. The co uh, this is a, a epidermoid. Epidermoid uh, is a very nice training uh, for <laughs> young colleagues to, 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 to uh, uh, preserve the uh, cranial nerves. So uh, I would like to show the uh, acoustic schwannoma. Uh, recent, uh, recently, I have uh, every week uh, acoustic neuroma. Uh, this is a, a big one, and this is a nurse in, in my university hospital. So, uh, so I try to remove ev uh, everything, but uh, as depend on the adhesion to the facial nerve, I remove the tumor capsule like this. So this is uh, this guy also like this. That uh, sometimes the uh, uh, patient uh, hearing recovered like this. This is 17 years old high school girls also. Uh, this is a policeman in my, uh, in my city. Uh, this is a uh, school teacher. Uh, so the, I choose a retrosigmoid approach. I will show you something. I am going to the uh, 11 snub first, and I cut the uh, 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 arachnoid first, and I suck the CSF, and slack uh, for the slack the cerebellum and then make a switch, uh, so like this. Uh, so usually, I, I don't use a retroactor, like, so for acoustic schwannoma. I'm checking the facial nerve, where is the facial nerve, no uh, surface of the facial nerve. And so then uh, I uh, open the uh, posterior wall of the uh, internal outer canal, like this, using a sonopet, like this. And then uh, 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 internal debulking using a CUSA, as much as possible. So they are going back to the internal water canal, and uh, be, uh, so like this. 
And then, so sometimes I use a, a facial nerve stimulator. This uh, Medotronix is a very useful to, 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 to elevate a tumor like this. And there's some, um, and the CP Young uh, uh, micro dissector I have. So this is uh, uh, the brain stem side, and the seven, this is uh, super vestibular, the inferior vestibular. I have to, 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 to se separate the uh, dissection plane from the dissection plane. So the, uh, I, I removed everything. The, 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 unfortunately, I, uh, this patient, I could uh, uh, remove the totally. This is, but some cases I leave so, and uh, some capsule uh, on the facial nerve, depend on the facial, so like this, that she, she can hear, and uh, so no facial nerve palsy. So uh, the microvascular decompression is also, uh, I will skip this one, maybe, maybe no, no need. So this is a cerebral vascular uh, uh, seminar. Also, this is uh, maybe last one. This is a vagina, uh, no, no, uh, vertebral artery, uh, thrombosis, anism. Uh, this uh, patient uh, complains of uh, uh, tetraplegia. And then, so uh, we decided to, to remove the everything to uh, also including a decompression to the brain stem. So I, I uh, preserved the vertebral artery uh, extra dura, extra durally. Okay, and then uh, this is a foramen magnum, the so, jugular tubercle, occipital, so vagina, vertebral artery is here. This is a, a, a foramen magnum. So I cut the dura like this, that you can see the over there, the thr thrombosis anism. Okay, so I uh, cut the uh, arachnoid here. So you can see the anism is here, and I uh, 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 expose the Proximal side and the distal side. The, this one, the, the distal side. Uh, so the anism is here. This is a junction, just a junction uh, from the extradural to the intradural. So my young colleague that puts a uh, coil, uh, no, no, uh, uh, clip here. Very nice. Proximal side and then distal side. So they and the still, and this. Uh, uh, thrombosis anism and the compress the uh, medulla, so the, uh, I decide to, to uh, remove the inside, as, so like this, the thrombosis uh, inside the, is a thrombosis, and the, sometimes the QSI is very useful. So there's still uh, this uh, uh, dentate ligament. The, the usually, it, this, is, this is okay, and uh, we, uh, I ha uh, had to finish. But uh, um, I try to uh, remove the everything, so usually no need, uh, but because uh, so there's some basal ba room that disturb the, uh, to, to, to uh, so like this, and uh, uh, separate from the uh, surface of the brainstem. And then, so I'm using uh, uh, scissors uh, sharply. Okay. And then I, I remove everything. So the after surgery, and she uh, has no deficit after surgery also, maybe. So uh, this is a uh, geographer, um, uh, Shuanoma. After surgery, and he is, uh, this guy's uh, facial palsy is uh, recovered, and also uh, hearing is recovered. Uh, so this one is geographer, um, Shuanoma's. So they also my university hospital accepted a foreign patient, uh, patient from a foreign country. This guy is from China, uh, ependymoma, uh, no, so, uh, I'm sorry, meningioma. Uh, after surgery, his uh, visual field deficit recovered. Also, t just a two uh, centimeter corticotomy uh, is enough. This is a girl from uh, Philippines. Uh, also, this guy is uh, from uh, Indonesia. This is a meningioma, a super, uh, the maybe a cause from a diaphragm. This is uh, from uh, India and uh, Nepal. Uh, so, so we uh, accept uh, everybody. So there, and, uh, I have uh, two or three, sometimes four cases, and uh, skull-based uh, surgery. 
And you, if you have a chance to come, uh, visit my university hospital, and uh, you are very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tameshima. Any questions? No questions? Professor Samishima, when you uh, op uh, go through Dolan's approach, and Dolan, yeah. yes, oh. and how you close uh, close the dura? What is the best way to cl oh. close closure the dura? Yes. Close, yeah. Ah, yeah. And uh, always I use the uh, um, uh, gel foam. You know, gel foam. Gel foam uh, yeah. yeah, gel foam and fibering glue, and uh, like a hundred from inside and outside around the optic sheet. Yeah, as much as possible, and uh, I uh, perform the stitch, direct the stitch. But around the uh, optic sheet, we cannot. So they, I use a gel foam and the fibering glue, like this sandwich. And then I um, um, stitch the meningorectal band to, to reduce the uh, extra dura space. Usually no, no, no CSS leak. I, I don't have. Actually, I don't like so much uh, because uh, you, usually I choose a retro sigmoid approach. No, no, no symptom after after surgery. Transport ventricle approach is uh, uh, so we so it's a, uh, so give the some you know symptom, especially for facial palsy and uh, abdominal palsy and uh, sometimes MLS, MLS syndrome. And, uh, I, I don't like so much for actually force ventricle approach. Uh, excuse me. Uh, nice presentation, sir. Uh, sir, uh, one case you presented of a craniopharyngeoma, a nine-year-old girl. Have you come across any case of hypothalamic dysfunction in, yeah, in your... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So they, uh, we have to take care of the, with the uh, uh, endocrine uh, doctors also. So all, 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 almost patient has a uh, need, a, um, what do I say, for hormonal um, recovery. You know. Because you're but, told but, uh, all some, patients. Some, guy, some, some patient uh, uh, does not need uh, within a six months. But some, especially kids, uh, need uh, maybe more. Especially uh, DH. But what about hypothalamus? Hypothalamic yes, dysfunction? Hypothalamus. I don't have a so, um, um, consciousness uh, disturbance, yeah. just a hormonal uh, problem. Oh, okay, you have not come across yeah. hypothalamus. Yeah. Okay. Oh, one more. <laughs> Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I have one question regarding uh, today's uh, cavernoma cases. Uh, in uh, MRI, uh, we saw there is a elevation in the left side, yeah. and uh, uh, but in during paraoperative, there was no difference, uh, like no elevation uh, like that. And also, uh, as you know, and I have uh, two cases experience of capundine cavernoma. So they say when uh, reaching the floor of the fourth ventricle, we saw the yellowish tint or yellowish tint or color change uh, in the floor of the fourth ventricle. So it was easy to locate because we have uh, no this type of monitor for <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, monitor. I, I, so, yeah, most, um, so just, just depend on the location. Yes. You know? And uh, be, uh, this uh, patient uh, uh, with tumor is uh, close to the, uh, the post ventricle. Okay. And uh, so usually as much as possible, I, I want to choose a lateral tumor approach is much, much easier for me. And, but 
these patients are uh, located in the to close to the post ventricle, and then so the usually uh, uh, supra facial or infra facial. Okay. So the this uh, uh, in the uh, just really here, and I choose the supra facial uh, corridor. Okay. Yeah, but uh, usually the, the patient has a uh, facial pathology, uh, uh, maybe uh, within a uh, uh, three, uh, three, yeah, three years, three years. Three to six months. So today's case was uh, like uh, uh, it's a good uh, suckable, uh, soft among suckable. Uh, soft among suckable. Yeah, yeah. Our uh, two cases we face is one case that the top top vessel, like the E was uh, very top, uh -huh. that uh, Kevin Roman sank. So uh, we uh, uh, like uh, less than 50 percent we removed. So, uh, how it, yeah. how it, yeah. it most is important thing is uh, how to uh, stop the deep breathing, okay. you know, not to remove everything. Okay. okay. Uh, so, the, for patient, uh, the no no recurrence is most important thing. So we don't need to remove everything. Every, oh. Yeah, especially we have to to to, to be careful for a uh, uh, venous. Uh, 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 what about this? Yeah, yeah, yes. Venus Dennis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. After surgery, and some patient had a venous uh, uh, breathing, yeah, yeah, after surgery. But uh, in that case, uh, there is an incomplete removal. Uh, we have a strict follow up, but no uh, re bleeding occur after the surgery. But do you think uh, if we uh, uh, consider less than 50% or like not complete? Removal is sounds yeah. of bleeding is. Uh, 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 I, I I I don't have a experience. Uh, so after surgery, so we yeah, are uh, yeah. it is uh, more than one year. Case, oh, but yeah. we are still oh, yeah. follow up. No yeah. pre bleed occurs. Yeah. But I was thinking if pre bleed occurs, then mm -hmm. how can I do? Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, acute case like uh, uh, just after bleeding, it's easy to remove the whole yeah. mass. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the uh, most important thing that yeah. the yes. stop the bleeding. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, that case come uh, like uh, uh, more than one year after uh, history, yeah, yeah. so that's why we can uh, could not remove the. Yeah, actually, whole yeah, whole yeah, yeah, difficult, yeah, difficult, difficult. disease, difficult disease. Yeah, actually. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Uh, Thank you, Professor Samishima. Uh, thank you very much for for the discussion. I'd like to close this session. Thank you so much. <laughs>Good evening, everybody. Uh, we start with the last session of today evening uh, with the young neurosurgeon session. Uh, is everybody ready or uh, shall we wait for some time till you have your snack and then we start? What do you feel? I think we should get ahead with the YNS session. 
Okay, the sir, the first doctor to come and present is Dr. I don't know how to. Ang uh, Wei Ping. Okay, and she would be presenting on application of ICG in aneurysm surgery, a local experience. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Ng from Malaysia. So I would like to share our local experience on application of indo signing green ICG video angiography in aneurysm surgery. So this is Malaysia, what we call Peninsula of West Malaysia. This is the hospital that I previously worked as, and the ICG is actually only applied in this hospital. So in this hospital, uh, the neurosurgery... Um, facilities established in 2008 of which this is brain so we have intraoperatively CT we have a uh, microscope that integrated with uh, fluorescent guided surgery but then um, I transferred to this hospital this is a pioneer hospital in Malaysia and this is Kaoma hospital so I transferred to this hospital since last year September and in this hospital we don't have intraoperatively CT we don't have uh, uh, ICG we don't and recently our um, ultrasound Doppler also spoiled Okay, so surgery is a definite and durable treatment for intracranial aneurysm as all of us know. The goal of aneurysm surgery is to complete obliterate the aneurysm sac while preserving the patency of parents' artery branching as well as perforating artery to maintain the tissue perfusion. So intraoperatively, under direct visualization is the principle of the surgery with careful dissection and proper permanent clip. Optimum exposure, sometimes bipolar coagulation and temporary clipping will be needed. However, despite all these things, there are unexpected neck of residuals, 4 to 19%, and unexpected also neck uh, vessel occlusion in 0.3 to 12%. So, ICG is, uh, inter uh, has been implemented into neurosurgical application in my previous hospital, Hospital Sungai Bulu, since 2011. And a total number of 68 ruptured anterior circulation uh, aneurysm cases was uh, surgically treated with this adjunct in between 2011 to 2017. So the ICG VM we apply before and after clipping. And before uh, and after clipping, we use uh, ultrasound Doppler. After clipping, before closure of the dura, we will uh, uh, do uh, computer tomography and geography. So the cases that we plan to use ICG, the return consent will be taken prior to the surgery, of which patient will be asked about history of uh, iodine allergic pregnancy or previous anaphylactic reaction to the dye. So some facts about ICG. This is a water-soluble near-infrared fluorescent hydrophilic tricarb uh, tricarbocyanic dye. One vial consists of 25 mg powder and the dosage is 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 mg per kg, maximum 5 mg per kg. So one, one vial is actually cost 20,000 uh, 20, Yen. So the mode of action is ICG will bind to chlorobrin within 1 to 2 seconds of IV injection and eliminated exclusively via hepatic metabolism with a half-life of 3 to 4 minutes. Adverse reaction, although it's rare, but there are still some adverse reaction of nausea, skin eruption, pruritus or anaphylactic reaction. So this is how we perform. Uh, in Hospital Sungai Bulu, uh, the, all the aneurysm will, will perform a subfrontal approach. So the, um, under normal uh, skin incision, antibiotic manito and uh, beef or VD will be inserted prior to the uh, opening. So a Leica microscope that integrated with ICG will be used and under microscope, the surgeon can visualize the blood flow and apply the aneurysm grip without need to move the microscope from the surgical field. The ultrasound Doppler will be performed before and after apply of the permanent clip. However, the choice of ICG only depends on surgeon decision and there are only two surgeons that are allowed to decide whether to use ICG or not in our centre. 
So the real-time video image of arterial capillary and venous phases was observed and recorded. So the clip position can be adjusted within two minutes if necessary and prior to closure, routine post-operatively CT angel will be performed. So this is a case that uh, 61 years old that come in with ruptured aircom aneurysm. So what we can see here is the ICG video angiography we perform after complete dissection of the aneurysm. So what we can see is this is the aneurysm next. This is the left A1, left right A1, right A2, and after gripping. One minute more. Okay. So a sujita clip will be placed and sparing the perforator. So post-op CT brain and CT angel will be performed and patient has a UN full post-operative course. So what is the advantages? And ICG is simple, easy to use, cost efficient, low complication, fast information, highly accurate and no interruption of the surgical manipulation. And there's no radiation as well as no need for a uh, professional operator. So the decision is, depends on the surgeon and simple and small aneurysm, no ICG will be used. So for the indication will be complex aneurysm, the aneurysm buried within the subranal clot when the neck cannot be identified to assess the patency of perforator and also clip induced stenosis. So the limitation is it need hardware, there is restricted surgical field, post positive finding when the short interval of ICG is used, blood clot brain tissue and small residual. So calcified thick ball atherosclerotic vessel will obliterate the finding. Okay, so <laughs> like in this case, uh, when there is a calcified taken atherosclerotic wall and thrombus aneurysm, we can't see the ICG. So this is the data analysis that done in 2011 to 2017. So um, we, we evaluate the usefulness as well as the limitation of this method and compare the accuracy with post-operative CT angio. So majority of our patients fall within 40 to 60 years old and are male. So Malaysia, most of the population are Malay, uh, majority of the patients with comorbid and a majority of patients with the PFMS grade 1 and grade 2. So the type aneurysm most is ACOM aneurysm followed by ACA as well as then MCA. The size large con consists the most and single lobe is the most. So the successful clipping was 92.6% and we found that ICG was useful in 97% and the most frequency of using is only two times. We encountered no side effect. In terms of survival, three mortality because of a complication of vessel spasm, two patient infection and heart attack, one patient. Majority of the patient had a good outcome. So to, uh, we compare the specificity as well as sensitivity of the ICG with CT angel, we find that the accuracy was 97.8%. So the main issue of aneurysm clipping is improper, uh, improper clip placements. So, uh, and all depends on surgeon experience under direct visualization, whether the patency of the vessel is preserved, whether there's any remnant of the neck. Of course, the adjunct uh, cerebral angiogram and ultrasound Doppler was used. With FDA approach, ICGVA was uh, first implemented in intra intravascular uh, and it has a 90% of correlation and leads to an eventful post-operative cost. So our results are comparable. We are able to achieve 92.7% with good score outcome skill and 92.6% achieve successful clipping with only 2.9% uh, vessel spasm risk occur. So as a conclusion, ICG is simple and reliable. It provides a real-time information of which the accuracy is up to 97.8% compared to CT angel. For less experienced surgeon, this adjunct actually helps to reduce post-operative morbidity. However, in selected difficult case, a combination of ICG as well as ultrasound Doppler are more effective. Thank you. ICG, the, the CT angio, is a more useful than a, a, a real-time ICG, I think, because the power rate is much more we can see with ICG. Thank you.
The next presentation is uh, Preoperative Embolization as a Brain Tumor Before a Brain Tumor Resection Strategy by Dr. Bilzadi Ferry. Yeah, the next talk is uh, the next presentation is factors affecting visual field outcome post surgery in cellular region tumors retrospective study by Dr. Prabhuram Sriram. Uh, hi everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm here today to present on factors affecting visual field outcome post surgery in cellular region tumors. It's a retrospective done by me from 2011 to 2017. Um, I came from Malaysia. And this is my hospital down there, Queen Elizabeth Hospital too. And basically, Sabah State. I came from the state of Sabah in Malaysia, which is uh, the, the capital of the state is Kota Kinabalu. These are the three state hospitals in uh, in the state. And behind the background that you see is the majestic Mount Kinabalu. It's the tallest in Southeast Asia, and we have a beautiful view of this every sunrise in the morning from our own house. I mean, our own hospital. All right, <clears throat> and this, the first one is the, sorry. Yeah, this is the Queen Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth II, and this is the Woman and Child Hospital, all three in Kota Kinabalu, and this is a Sipadan Island in Sabah, with the beautiful corals and the best spot for diving in the world. All right, uh, moving on to my topic. Uh, basically, first, uh, introduction to cellar region. It's a tiny space in the center of a cranial base and uh, contains vital neurovascular structures. However, the definition of cellular region has been very vague in studies without a clear de definition for cellular, paracellular, and also supracellular. Uh, however, some, some literature, some articles does, uh, does define it as extending from the basis phenoid sinus to the laterally up to the cavernous sinus. And in this region, we, have, we, have to, we do see a diverse kind of pathologies, including neoplastic, congenital, vascular, inflammatory, and infective processes. But what unique of this uh, region is most of it presents with a s almost similar clinical symptoms, uh, commonly which is a headache and visual field disturbance due to proximity of the optic nochism as well. Uh, just an example of an uh, MRI of a cellular region tumor. So basically, like I said, the, uh, the extension of the anatomy from the basis phenoid sinus uh, up to the super, uh, supra, <coughs> supracellar portion or the uh, inferior wall of floor of the third ventricle, and also uh, laterally up to the cavernous sinus. And uh, as I said, one of the close proximity for this region of the tumor is the optic nerve, and uh, visual, visual uh, disturbances has been one of the main indications for us to go uh, to do surgery for this region. And uh, how do we assess for visual assessment? Basically, we have a few assessments on vision, visual acuity, color vision, Optic nerve head, I mean looking for papillary edema or pale optic disc, pupillary function basically for third and fourth, and visual field. Visual acuity does give a uh, uh, visual assessment specifically for fovea centralis. Color vision gives an early detection of a visual disturbance, particularly red, uh, um, red color blindness or red desaturation, sorry. And uh, what we are here today to talk about visual field. All right. And we shall feel there's a few methods of assessment, uh, confrontational test, which is the most crude way of assessing on the bedside. And tangent screens has been an old school uh, assessment of a visual field. Goldman kinetic perimetry fields, uh, it has been used still in some places. However, it doesn't give a quantitative analysis. And uh, automated perimetry, which we are going to talk about today. And finally, is multifocal visual evoke potential, MVEP, uh, which is at this current of moment is more for academic and research in research settings for visual field assessment. Right, automatic parametry is basically, uh, it uses computer algorithm. In the, uh, uh, <clears throat> it has a 70% sensitivity in detecting field defects. How, uh, it is also independent of examiner because it's based on a computer threshold algorithm. And uh, the original automated parametry actually takes very long 
because it, uh, it examines the entire visual field. So they came up with a uh, CETA Swedish inf interactive threshold algorithm, which uh, limits the range of, range of assessment to 24, which is CETA 24. Um, and that has reduced the time of assessment to 5.87 minutes per patient. And this allows quantification of visual field defect. And how does this allow quantification of field defect? I'll show you later. But basically, this is the, uh, the machine. One of the problems with automated perimetry that we see is fatigue, because it does really require a concentration, of, uh, concentration by the patient. And um, a patient with poor responsive or uh, uncooperative patient, you will not get a proper good uh, automated perimetry results. And uh, this is how we are going to get a quantitative assessment from, uh, uh, from automated perimetry. Uh, what automated perimetry that we use is the Humphrey visual field assessment. All right? And uh, this value, is mean deviation value, is what we, got, what we get from this uh, uh, AP. And it's unique to each eye. It's crucial to see the changes of visual field defect over time. And this is what we are interested as we are comparing uh, pre- and post-surgery. And uh, it does signify an overall abnormality of a visual field in each eye. And it depicts an overall abnormality of the vision as well. So this is an example of uh, uh, Humphrey visual field results that we see. And what we are interested here is this value, mean deviation. And this gives, uh, as I said, it's an overall abnormality in the visual field. And um, yeah. How uh, these tests also need to be dependent on the reliability of this test, and this reliability depends on the false positive and negative, and also the fixation losses. We accept fixation losses less than 20%, and uh, that we consider as a reliable test. So the objective of our study is basically to determine factors associated with visual field improvement after surgery. And uh, I did a retrospective study on patients who underwent surgical treatment for these uh, cellular region tumors. July 2010 to 2016. And uh, on all our patients, postoperatively, we routinely do a repeat assessment on Humphrey uh, uh, after three Five months. Up. All right, uh, these are my inclusion criteria for my studies. Basically, I take uh, all cellular region tumor patients, regardless of pathology. And my results, uh, mean age of my patient, group of patients was 46, uh, mostly male. And uh, the commonest uh, presenting symptom here, if you see, is visual field loss. Of course, one of the reasons here, because I only took patients with visual field disturbances uh, to, because I'm assessing the improvement in visual field. And uh, the symptom duration is uh, at the mean of 9.7 months, tumor, uh, tumor volume about 14.7, and uh, the duration of surgery is about 259 minutes. These are the factors that are going to uh, analyze, analyze later. And most of them, of course, pituitary adenoma. Uh, commonest approach was transphenoidal and uh, followed by transcranial and supraorbital. And, <coughs> yep. uh, sorry, visual field assessment. So the, uh, the first pre-surgery, the uh, average mean deviation value we got is minus 14. Post-surgery is minus 12.4. That shows some improvement over the mean. And overall, the patient 70.9% improved in their visual field and 29 uh, showed no improvement. And based on univariate analysis, we found that sex, Symptom duration, diagnosis uh, for pituitary adenoma and salamin, uh, pituitary adenoma, and uh, also for surgical approach shows a significant uh, um, factor that affects the uh, improvement of visual field after the surgery. However, on multivariate analysis, the only uh, factors that remain are symptom duration and surgical approach, which uh, does logically be explained as symptom duration. The longer the compression does, uh, does cause ischemic changes in the nerve, and subsequently, the restoration of the external flow after decompression uh, might not be uh, significant. And a surgical approach, transphenoidal has a better visual field outcome uh, compared to transcranial and supraorbital. So as a conclusion, my study uh, factors affecting, we found that symptom duration and surgical approach has significant effect on the outcome when other confounders are adjusted. Shorter duration of symptoms and transphenoidal surgery uh, and transcranial in comparison to supraorbital has a favorable outcome for visual field. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Do you have any question? No? 
Okay, everyone. Okay. The third presentation is uh, Anatomy of the Third Ventricle as seen during Neuroendoscopy in Infants. Dr. Benjamin. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Benjamin Okanga. Dr. Benjamin Okanga from uh, Coast General Hospital in Mombasa, Kenya. Uh, Mombasa is a, is, a, is a town in East Africa, bordering in the Indian Ocean, and it's famous for uh, beautiful beaches and uh, resorts and warm weather. You're most welcome to come. Uh, my topic is, uh, as, as you see here, anatomy of the, uh, the third ventricle, uh, seen uh, in neuroendoscopy. Uh, in East Africa, Hydrocephalus is a, very, is a very common problem. It's the most common problem that we see. It accounts for up to 60% of new presentation of cases. And uh, we don't exactly know the numbers. You can only extrapolate. We get about 6,500 cases per year. Uh, we think most of these are post-infectious. Uh, we have problems. Patients have problems presenting. They come late. We have uh, severe macrocephalus. Uh, we have a lot of... Uh, neurological deficit. We also have uh, constraints with uh, facilities. Uh, we depend a lot on shunts, but we have problems with shunt failures, as, as you all know. Uh, we did a study to basically document uh, aberrant findings in these patients with uh, severe microcephaly uh, during uh, endoscopic third ventricul ventriculostomy. Uh, this this study was carried out uh, in two hospitals in Nairobi. Uh, we used a rigid endoscope. As I said, facilities are a problem, so we had to get a surgeon who has an endoscope, and we followed him around. And uh, we were only able to get 43 cases in six months. And uh, we used uh, video recordings. What we found was uh, <coughs> following the, the, the six-month duration and observation, we found uh, most patients had hydrocephalus associated with uh, post-infectious etiology, about 60%. Uh, about 14% uh, uh, had myelomeningocele causing hydrocephalus. Uh, congenital, congenital causes, acridactyl stenosis, uh, Dundee Walker malformations caused about 25% of cases, and uh, maybe an, uh, the other lesser cases. And this study is was similar to compare to other parts of uh, Africa, for example, Nigeria and, uh, and Uganda. Uh, we also found that uh, among the, f the findings, the variant anatomic findings, are that uh, in the third ventricle fl uh, floor, there was a lot of scarring. These are significant findings, scarring of the prepontine system and aqueduct, uh, closure of the aqueduct. We thought this was significant as a result of the post-infectious causes. Uh, in the lateral ventricles, we had uh, s uh, s f uh, common findings include uh, hemosiderin deposits, uh, fibrin strands, and septation. Uh, what we think is that uh, because of this, I mean, if, if, uh, if variant, find variant findings are common, they're frequent, especially because of the post-infectious etiology. And we think that some variant findings uh, during endoscopy are predictive of success or failure of, uh, of the procedure. 
and I think the most important findings would be probably open aqueducts or prepontine uh, cistern scarring, which are strong uh, indicators for failure of the procedure. Thank you. Question. Please. Uh, we initially did uh, just endoscopy, and then in case where we could, we proceeded with an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, where we could uh, relieve the hydrocephalus. Because endoscopic third ventriculostomy, usually it is not recommended below two years of age, and it is contraindicated in infections, usually. Um, I know the studies, but what, what you're trying to, what we see is that uh, where there is scarring and where you have some 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 anatomic findings, some studies have suggested that you can actually proceed with the with the ETV. See, the presentation is basically about intraventricular findings. Uh, third ventricular findings as seen in neuroendoscopy in patients with hydrocephalus. So, what he wants to stress is the changes in ventricles occurring, which are suggestive of infection in the past. So, the infectious etiology being common, as he says, these are the findings. It's a point to be noted that in where he practices, these things are very commonly seen in uh, third ventricular uh, endoscopy. Thank you. <laughs> Neurosurgery in uh, Mozambique by Dr. Sergio Salvador. So good evening, everybody. My name is Sergio Salvador. <coughs> I come from Mozambique. Um, that is a southernist uh, country of <coughs> Africa. Um, between me and Dr. Benjamin, there is only Tanzania. <laughs> and Mozambique is known by, like Kenya, by beautiful beaches uh, and wonderful beers, too. Uh, and you are more than welcome to visit. The water is very warm, the weather is awesome, hot and wet. And uh, after all of these um, presentations that we seen um, yesterday and today, um, I'm thinking where we are in Mozambique about neurosurgery, I feel like, um, like I'm working with uh, Walter Dandy and Harvin Cushing actually. You know this picture? Yeah. Maybe from 2001, Space Odyssey. You know, you know the film, the movie? Yeah, it's when the monkey discovered the first weapon, a bone. Well, um, Mozambique is a almost 30 million people uh, country. Uh, three public facilities uh, in, with neurosurgery that is signed in, on the south and the center and the north. From the south to the north is almost um, 3,400 kilometers of line coast. And there is only three Mozambican neurosurgeons. One of them is me, uh, working, of course. <laughs> and five foreign neuros neurosurgeons. Two of them are Russians who stay in Mozambique from the late 1970s, early 1980s, time of Cold War. And the other three are Cubans. Um, that are almost finishing their contracts, so they are leaving Mozambique. Um, this is uh, basically statistics of major surgeries in 2017 uh, along these three um, major hospitals. Few surgeries, because um, neurosurgery only have one day per surgery uh, during a week, so we only operate once a week. Uh, major, major pathology is hydrocephalus and traumatic brain injury, uh, then um, other pathologies. So main facility is in Maputo, where I'm placed um, most of all, or more than half of that surgery is uh, made in Maputo. 
Uh, main pathology, of course, hydrocephalus, as in Kenya and almost Africa. And traumatic brain injury, traumatic um, um, spine injury, then tumors, infections, and other, other, the other diseases. Uh, the second facility uh, in terms of neurosurgery is on the north, uh, and um, also main pathology, hydrocephalus, but uh, Dr. João Carlos, that is Adam Mozambican, doing a lot of spine there. And the third one is in the center. Uh, almost of pathologies is hydrocephalus, neural tube defects, uh, and traumatic brain injury. So this is our reality. As you can see, we don't have vascular pathology. Uh, my, training, my training was not in Mozambique. I trained in Portugal. In Europe, my old training was made in Europe, and with conditions similar to to those who, who, who have seen in this in these facilities. And after that, I back to the reality. So, what's in my point of view the major constraints in Mozambique? Um, the related to, to to diagnosis and particularly to the vascular neurovascular pathology. Well, the general practitioner no, don't, don't have know-how, sufficient know-how to think about uh, a, a vascular or neurovascular um, pathology. Then uh, the local epidemiology. Uh, we have, um, in terms of pathologies in Mozambique, we have uh, malaria. You, you know what malaria is, a parasitic disease. So um, we have lots of malaria. We have lots of uh, opportunistic uh, diseases related to HIV. Uh, so those pathologies uh, normally, uh, the one of the symptoms is uh, uh, headaches. So when a patient comes with headache to, uh, to a facility, the main thing is malaria. Take some tablets, go home. It's time? <laughs> we can continue. <laughs> Uh, so the patient comes after two or three days and again, headaches, 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 and okay, let's run a CT scan. Oh, blood in the brain. Oh, this is a hemorrhagic a stroke, so ICU. Nobody think about in a rupture aneurysm. Uh, they can see the subarachnoid hemorrhage, but they will look for the clot and say, this is an hemorrhagic stroke not an uh, aneurysm, a ruptured aneurysm. Then, in neurosurgery as itself, we have a lack of neurosurgical instruments and a lack of human resources um, also. So, the challenge for this country uh, is to improve the human resources. N now we have three senior residents and four junior, very, very junior, uh, like children residents. <laughs> Um, and a goal, in my point of view, is uh, to, to, to have one or two new neurosurgery residents every year and improve the knowledge of medicine school about neurosurgical conditions and in terms of diagnosis, management, um, basically on the stroke, hydrocephalus, trauma, that can help us to uh, diagnose and then to uh, treat. Then to improve the, the assets on the, on the ward and especially on the theater. So we don't have microscope. Um, we don't have microsurgical instruments. We don't have microscope. Uh, neuro navigation, no electric craniotomy. We still do craniotomies with uh, jiggly so, you know? Uh, and the, the, the burrows also manual. Uh, no C-arm. So my dream, and it's my dream, is uh, build um, our own facility independent, physically independent of the other, the, the hospital um, facilities and with awards, a HDU <coughs> and a theater. And uh, also contribute to, to improve the other, uh, let's say neurological related areas because neurosurgeon doesn't work alone. We have to work with uh, neuro neurology, we have to work with neuro radiology, neurophysiology, intensive care, neurointensive care, neuroanesthesia. So we have only one neuro neurologist in, in my facility. 
we don't have neurophysiology. Uh, neuroradiology is impossible. We have uh, basic radiologists. We don't have an MRI uh, working for two years now. We just have a CT scan in Mozambique. I'm speaking about the public sector, of course. Uh, that is my hospital. So in public sector, we don't have MRIs. We, don't, we only have uh, two CT scans in the south and the north in all of the country. Um, so uh, contribute to build um, a stronger team than to take care of um, these people. So this is Mozambique. You're more than welcome. Thank you. By the way, Mozambique is the only country in the world who still have an a, a AK-47 in the flag. <laughs> so maybe I, I think you should support uh, the WFNS because they have some uh, donation system. So you can yes, contact yes. the secretary yet. Pro professor told me yesterday, yes. Yes. And also that you should uh, educate uh, uh, ordinary students you should find uh, the hemorrhagic stroke yeah that's 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 one of the one of the, um, the goals is uh, educate speak about uh, the, the issue professor I have something to say uh, I realized a lot of things after coming here to this uh, seminar uh, one was we increased our knowledge and second is uh, I realized how lucky many of us are working in so-called underdeveloped Asian nations where uh, when we hear to Dr. Sergio and Dr. Benjamin speak, I was amazed at, like, you know, you have a huge country and there are just five neurosurgeons or six neurosurgeons. We can't imagine. This is all, you know, like we are still living in the primitive times. And I don't know how we do it, but I think this is a forum, especially Professor Yoko Kato's efforts, uh, should take us a long way in improving the neurosurgical facilities and healthcare facilities with relation to neurosurgeon the world over. We wish him all the best. Uh, we wish Dr. Benjamin also all the best and ask them to continue with their hard work in providing neurosurgical facilities in their country. The next topic is uh, intracranial venous sinus stenosis by Dr. Zhu. Hello everyone, uh, it's my pleasure to do the presentation. Uh, my name is Zhou Dejun, uh, is a student from Shanghai uh, Shuguan Hospital. Today I want to talk uh, uh, report, uh, a case report uh, regarding uh, intracranial hematoma by venous sinus stenosis. A 24-year-old uh, female wa uh, was transferred to the hospital for, med for medical treatment uh, two hours after suffering a sudden left-sided headache uh, during the meal uh, with uh, main, main, uh, main symptoms of, uh, uh, um, with main uh, symptoms of uh, frequent, vom uh, uh, frequent vomiting, uh, loss of consciousness, and uh, mm, loss of consciousness and, uh, and uh, 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 <laughs> The physical, e e uh, physical examination uh, showed that uh, bilateral dilated pupil and right-sided hypermyotonia. Uh, then the emergency doctor sent her for the head CT and CDA immediately. Okay, uh, the CT scan uh, showed uh, uh, left-sided uh, occipital temporal uh, uh, hematoma uh, with uh, sarcoid hemorrhage. Uh, and uh, left uh, and the, sh uh, the shift of uh, mid midline structure from left to right. And the CTA uh, revealed an abnormal artery, but did not reveal any 
associated uh, associated uh, drainage main. Uh, neither the head city and the CTA uh, show uh, showed any uh, AVM nodes or any rhythms. Uh, given the results, we made a tentative diagnosis. Uh, cerebral hernia, intracranial hemorrhage, or perhaps AVM or DAVF. So uh, the patient went through uh, surgery for removal of intracranial hematoma, decompressive craniectomy, ICP monitoring, and beyond that, uh, we tried to find the insidious vascular lesions during the operation. Uh, finally, uh, we removed the intracranial hematoma smoothly, but did not find any uh, abnormal blood vessels during the operation. Okay, uh, the post-operative CD uh, showed uh, the, ob uh, the, the uh, obvious um, reduction of uh, left side uh, uh, intracranial hematoma. And in order to uh, identify the etiology, uh, the patient went through the DSA on the 13th hospital day. And uh, it didn't show any, uh, show any uh, AVM or any uh, or aneurysm uh, and uh, some uh, abnormal uh, artery. But the, re the result of the DSA showed But the rest of the, the GSA uh, showed that uh, the junction of transver uh, the left uh, transverse uh, sinus and the sigmoid sinus was narrowed. So uh, the patient went through an um, MRV in the 21st hospital day and the image of the MRV uh, showed that uh, the left uh, sided, le left sided, uh, like, uh, left -sided uh, like venous sinus was narrowed distinctly. Okay, just like it here. Okay. Okay, uh, one, one month after the operation, uh, the patient uh, restored uh, grad uh, consciousness gradually, uh, like, uh, uh, gradually uh, GCS in uh, increased uh, significantly and uh, neuros, uh, neurological symptoms uh, improved markedly. Then uh, she was advised to discharge. And we suggest that she should review the head CD and MRV in a mouse, take an thrombotic therapy uh, and uh, have cranial, uh, cranial aplasty in three months. Okay, o only one more minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, what we are concerned about is whether or not intracranial, intracranial hematoma uh, is associated with uh, intracranial venous sinus stenosis in this case. Uh, thrombosis, uh, uh, some results show that uh, uh, thrombosis, uh, can, uh, thrombosis uh, is uh, uh, secondary <laughs> to the uh, intracranial venous sinus stenosis uh, causing slow blood flow and at the end of that, uh, uh, thrombo uh, both thrombosis and uh, ven uh, increased venous pressure can lead to uh, intracranial hemorrhage. And uh, I, uh, finally, I want to point out that uh, 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 choosing simple medication therapy or uh, invention in interventional therapy as the follow-up treatment is uh, uh, worth being discussed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the nice presentation. What is the cause of the sinus stenosis? Huh? What is the cause of the sinus stenosis? What's the what cause is the cause? cause? Reason, uh, reason, uh, etiology. What do you think? Etiology, uh, I think maybe the th uh, thrombosis. Thrombosis? Thrombosis, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
and it's just a practice for a young uh, neurosurgeon. So um, I think. We do think the uh, cause of uh, stenosis of the transverse sinus is thrombosis. No, it's normal. It's a uh, normal fa family, normal past uh, medical history. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, The next presentation. Uh, Atlantoaxial fixation for odontoid fracture. Analysis of 124 surgically treated cases by Dr. Ravi Kiran Bhutha. Good evening, uh, honorable professors and my colleagues from across the globe. My name is Dr. Ravikiran Vota. I hail from India, from Mumbai. Uh, this is my college, King Edward Memorial Hospital. Uh, it's a GS Medical College, the premier institute and the referral center for the entire western zone of India. I hail from a department headed by Professor Atul Goel, under whose auspices this study that I'm going to mention has been conducted. Our hospital is an 1,800-bedded hospital uh, with uh, 1.8 million outpatients uh, every year and at least 85,000 indoor patients every year. So I don't know about the whole city, but at least my hospital not, doesn't sleep. Mumbai, city that never sleeps. Coming to my topic, atlantoaxial fixation for odontoid fractures, an analysis of 124 surgically treated cases. Odontoid fractures are relatively common and trauma and osteoporosis either singly or jointly being incriminated in almost all cases of odontoid fractures. Anderson and Dolanzo classification has been the backbone of the treatment followed. A number of anterior and posterior methods of fixation have been explained in the past. We describe our strategy. Clinical or radiological evidence of manifest or potential atlantoaxial instability form the indication for posterior atlantoaxial fixation. This is the Anderson Delonzo classification, type one oblique fractures, type two fractures going through the waist, type three fractures extending into the body of C2. There were 96 males and 28 females aged between 12 to 80 years in our classification. Apart from the Anderson Delonzo classification uh, types, which included six patients of type one, 93 of type two, and 25 of type three, we included a subclassification within this classification namely type A, B, and C. Type A included those patients, namely 118, in which there were a vertical malalignment. Type A1, in which there was compression. Type A2, where there was distraction of the fracture fragments. These could ag again be subdivided into ones which had an anterior tilt, central, and a posterior tilt of the uh, fracture fragments. Type B included 49 uh, cases where the fracture resulted in direct malalignment of the facets of C1 and C2. Type 3 included patients in which the fracture involved the facet of the axis directly. Fractures were divided into acute when they were less than three months old, delayed when they were between three months to one year, and chronic when they were beyond a duration of one year. All patients were treated with posterior atlantoaxial fixation, and mean average follow-up was of 72 months. 
this is the classification type 1, uh, 2, 2A, 2B, 2C, according to Grower et al., 2A being a horizontal fragment, 2B being an anterior oblique, and 2C being a posterior oblique, and type 3. This is our classification, A1, A2, B, and C that I mentioned just now. These are images of uh, the fractures, the type 1, MRI, CT, post fixation, type 2, posterior tilt, type 2, CT, facetal instability, now the canal widened, aligned, screw placement, C1, C2. Images of type 3 fractures going up to the base, MRI, CT, facetal instability, post uh, C1, C2 fixation, the screw placement. Thus, we had a total of 115 cases in type A1, 3 cases in A2, 49 cases in type B, and 25 cases in type C. These are the images of type 2 fractures with anterior tilt, facetal instability, a 3D model, now the aligned uh, CT image, and the screw placements. Type 2 with a posterior tilt, fracture fragment, facetal instability, now aligned post-surgery, the screw placements. All patients having type 2 and subtypes of type A to C were considered suitable candidates for surgery. Indications for patients with type 1 and type 3 fractures included those who had post-traumatic neurodeficits or persistent neck pain for more than three months. Evidence of abnormal cord signal, abnormal movements, fracture fragments, atlantoaxial facets, either static or dynamic, favored surgical treatment. How did we uh, grade the improvement? You see A, B, C, D, A, A S, I, A grading. The worst being the grade four. We had four patients preoperatively of grade B, none postoperatively. The best being 50, the postoperatively 95 patients uh, functionally. Uh, Goel ha sir has his own classification, grade one being the independent normal functioning and grade five being unable to walk and dependent. You see 16 patients pre-op, none post-op and 50 patients pre-op independently walking, 95 patients sent home walking. I conclude. Even though in our study we do not have a direct comparison between a posterior and anterior fixation, the successful outcome of patients, each and every patient operated uh, in our study, and the average 25% failure rate of uh, anterior fixation, the suitability of anterior fixation only in a small proportion of cases with the ensuing minor and major complications of oriented screw uh, fixation and the worst uh, conservative non-surgical management suggest the validity of posterior fixation that we have entered. Thank you. I can't comment on this paper because Professor Atul Goel has been my examiner once upon a time. So I don't dare uh, tell anything about his paper or his students. It's a good presentation, large series, and uh, I'm sure under Dr. Goel's guidance, definitely it would be a good work. Congratulations. My best wishes to Dr. Goel, sir. This presentation is an extraspinal intra intradural surgical approach for C2 neuronomas, a report of an experience with 50 cases, Dr. Sandeep More. And I hope this too is not coming from Dr. Goel's uh, stable, <laughs> because I won't be able to comment on that again. <laughs>
the title of my study is the extraspinal and the interdural surgical approaches for C2 neuronoma and the report of experience with the 50 cases. Uh, to begin with the introduction, uh, uh, if uh, as we all know, the C2 neuronoma uh, C2 neuroma uh, is a benign tumor uh, arising from the C2 ganglion, and unlike other uh, cervical ganglia, C2 neuronoma uh, uh, C2 ganglia is situated uh, outside the uh, spinal foramen, uh, posterior to the C1 C2 facets, and which is exposed to the posteriorly, which which can be. Uh, uh, reached uh, posteriorly uh, reflecting the uh, muscle uh, muscle of the C C uh, C1 C2 posterior arch, and uh, if we know the anatomical and sub uh, dural sub uh, dural uh, covering of the uh, tumor, th then it is possible to remove the tumor without uh, uh, disturbing the bo uh, bone uh, bone anatomy. In our in uh, in our present study, we could remove the tumor. Uh, uh, we could remove the tumor uh, to the interdural approach without uh, without disturbing the bone bony anatomy and opening the middle uh, spinal dural tube. And along with we study the clinical profile and anatomical peculiarities and outcome of this uh, discrete form of benign spinal tumor are evaluated. Uh, this was the uh, classification we had published in our previous study uh, 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 based on the anatomical and the there are uh, dural relationship. Uh, type A neuronomas are located in the spinal canal uh, uh, which had extension medially into the spinal canal. Uh, type B uh, is uh, located in the C2 ganglion that is in the C, uh, posterior to the C1, C2 uh, 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 arch and then type C tumor had extension uh, uh, in the paraspinal region. Uh, these are the few images uh, showing the uh, C2 neuronomas. Upper two images are showing uh, C2 neuronomas in the C2, uh, uh, C2 region, and the and the left side uh, tumor, uh, left side uh, images showing the type A, type type A, and the type B that is uh, extension into the spinal canal. The uh, lower two images showing the post-op uh, images of the same patient uh, showing complete excision, uh, complete excision of the tumor. Uh, the 3D CT of the same patient uh, showing the intact uh, posterior arch of C1 and the posterior lamin of the C2 vertebra. Uh, similar, the another patient uh, who had uh, uh, all the three components, uh, the type A, type B, and type C uh, component of the C2 neuronomas. So we uh, uh, we studied the details of 50 patients who had a 55 C2 neuronomas from our database, uh, we which were uh, treated surgically between 2006 to 2016, and their uh, clinical profile we studied respectively, uh, respectively, and they were followed till 10 years of till 10 years. The results, uh, the we had a patient from uh, uh, from 14 years to 70 years, and the mean age of presentation was 36 year. Uh, out of 50, uh, out of 50 patients, five patients had a bilateral C2 neuronomas, and the six patient had a evidence of NF2, and the NF2 patient had a multiple cranial spinal and the other extraspinal tumors. So, the coming to the summary, uh, maximum of the patient uh, were in the age, age uh, group of 21 to 50, and uh, there was a total 17 patients. That is, maximum patient were in 31 to 40 age group. We had a maximum number of uh, major, uh, the major, uh, there were major me, uh, male in our study, so that is 72% and the 28% were the female. And uh, duration of symptoms, so maximum patient had presented, uh, presented after the one year of age and uh, there were some patients who had presented before the uh, one year of age, like almost uh, 50 to 40 to 50, 50, 50% 50 uh, patient had uh, presented before one year of age. And the uh, major of these patients uh, had presented with the symptoms of myelopathy and uh, followed by sensory disturbances. And some patients had uh, the local symptoms like neck pain and the radicular pain. So radiologically, uh, when we classified the tumor, the every, uh, every tumor uh, had the type B component that is the origin of the tumor. 
and the 16 per 16% of the uh, tumor had a medial extension into the spinal canal and the 10% uh, had a lateral extension that is extra spinal component so the uh, con conclusion of the study was uh, that despite being the last tumor uh, last tumor arising from the c2 ganglion uh, that we can remove the tumor uh, with the interdural approach without opening the uh, spinal uh, dural the uh, spinal dural uh, layer or removing the any bony posterior bony element and there were a minimal risk of vertebral artery injury or venal sinus injury as there was a dural membrane which was separating the main bulk of the tumor. Thank you. For uh, those doctors, there was an excellent paper. I, I'm sure I mean, Dr. Goel never presents in singles. It's always 50, 100, 200, 500, 700, 1,000. I know that. And for uh, doctors coming from other countries, other Asian countries, uh, working with Dr. Goel is a pleasure because uh, he has a, such a huge amount of cases. Like he, It's a factory. I can call that a factory for uh, spinal cases. And he's a pioneer in CV Junction. He's a very big name in CV Junction the world over today. And it would definitely be a pleasure to work with him. But uh, it's like he's like Professor Kato, Kato, he's a workaholic, so he needs you to be around all the time. You can't take rest when he's around. So beware before you go, but you will have a nice time there. Thank you. That was a nice talk. Thank you. So uh, thank you for your participation today to all of you. And tomorrow uh, we will meet here early morning. What time? 7.30? 8, 8, 8 a.m. Uh, uh, please be exactly on time, like Japanese people, please. <laughs> thank you. Have a great time.